in the bag before I'm in the shot. <laughs> Good afternoon. I now call to order the fifth and final general session of the 56th General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Welcome, my friends. We have had some busy, busy days, some joy, some tragedy, and we are now in the home stretch. So let us center with our chalice lighting, and then we will begin our business from the youth and young adults. We light our chalice with the words of the Reverend Dr. Mel Hoover. We can dare to face ourselves in our entirety, to understand our pain, to feel the tears, to listen to our frustration and confusion, and to discover new capacities and capabilities that will empower and transform us. For the next few minutes, we are going to listen to a group of young adults talk a little bit about some of their experiences, their hopes, and their dreams. So let's welcome our young adults at GA for this panel discussion. So hi, y'all. You might remember me as part of the TriMod. I know, I'm, it's a different role now. Um, but we're going to spend some time just chatting. We wanted to take the opportunity at this General Assembly to think about how we experience race, racism, and oppression differently in a truly intersectional way, uh, talking about how it interacts with class and gender and sexuality. And so we're going to take just a few minutes to do that. For the time being, I want to start at the end, and I invite you to tell us your name, your gender pronouns, and any other important information that we should know about you. Great. Uh, so my name is Reverend Renwa Hamami. My pronouns are she, her, and they, them. And I identify as Egyptian Lebanese and as a Unitarian Universalist Muslim. I'm Charlie Smith. Um, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. Uh, I identify as a black UU. Good morning, all. My name is Vanessa Burchell. I uh, go by the pronouns she, her, hers. And I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. And I identify as an atheist Unitarian Universalist. Hi, my name is Casey Slack. My pronouns are they, them, and I am white and a UU pagan. And finally, as your panel moderator, I'm Greg Boyd. I use he, him, his, and I'm a black Unitarian Universalist. So we'll just go down the line in the same way again. I want to know, what are a few ways that race has shaped your experience of General Assembly um, during this week or even in comparison to other General Assemblies? I appreciate that you told me I wasn't going to have to go first if I sat in this chair, so thank you. <laughs> so one way that I feel that this experience, uh, that my experience as an Egyptian Lebanese and Unitarian versus Muslim person has been shaped uh, this GA has been that I've honestly kept largely to people of color spaces, um, partially because of my role um, and partially because I knew that those were spaces where I would feel safe um, and would be held in community. Um, and as a part of going to those spaces, it's actually been really wonderful to see youth and young adults finding those communities 
uh, sometimes for the very first time, and connecting with people that have been a part of our faith for so long. The flip side to that is I've noticed that some of my elders and my mentors are not in the room. And it's been hard to see that gap of people who have either left Unitarian Universalism or have died um, or been pushed out because of their race or ethnicity. So that's been part of how my um, experience is shaped in those spaces. And related to that, um, I feel that I, I've found myself in a more uh, empowered place because I have that community. And so when I am out in the larger GA world, I'm more, uh, I know my power to challenge the microaggressions and macroaggressions that I experience sometimes when leading workshops um, and feel like, yes, I am allowed to interrupt and engage with problematic language or actions. Thank you. So as a youth of color at GA, it's been a really great experience. It's been a lot better than the last GA I was at. Uh, like you mentioned, I was able to seek out spaces specifically for youth of color, which was nice. Um, I feel like as a community, we're doing well with race, but we're not doing nearly well enough. Um, like, how many of you are wearing Black Lives Matter memorabilia? Um, I'm not sure that we all should be. There's like people with dreadlocks who are not black. There's people using African American vernacular English when they are not black. And I feel like if you want to be able to wear that badge, saying that our lives really do matter to you, then you need to not just be doing that here in our community. You need to be out there living it. Um, I know it can be hard when someone calls you out on your behavior, but you need to realize that this is not the time for that. Now is the time to put away your tears and stand up for people of color. Uh, what's interesting is that my whole GA has been shaped uh, by race because I am the inaugural uh, Thrive at GA coordinator here at this General Assembly. So my sole function, thank you, my sole function has been to uh, ensure that there were uh, space and, and support for people of color, indigenous folks, uh, to be able to feel safe here at GA. And so that's been the majority of what I've been doing with my time and ensuring that I was that bridge to connect them to those spaces, the drum space, the blue space, so that they could be able to go get some safety, maybe get some support from some of those chaplains and be able to still enjoy GA. Uh, this has been a very different experience as compared to uh, my other GA experiences. I was in Portland uh, and then I was also in Columbus and I remember walking away brokenhearted and crying during um, at both of those GAs at various times. Uh, and at this one, I've only had one hiccup, but I think I could be able to deal with that. And I'm just really glad that I was able to even be here and be a support person. And I hope that my presence allow other folks to be able to have a positive, refreshing general assembly. I think um, as a white person, race at GA affects me in the same way that it affects me everywhere, which is to say it shapes how I interact with the world. Um, and I see so clearly how easy it would be for me to behave as though my race was invisible. Right? In a white space, it's really easy as a white person to just be like, well, I'm neutral. This is, you know, this is fine. I don't have to think about that. But I do. And white folks, you do. In this context, I think white people get a little too comfortable, right? We have our Black Lives Matter badge on, and we say, oh, look how good I am. Yeah, okay, keep working. So for me, it's a, I have access to conversations that might be draining for y'all, and I don't want to ever cause you to be drained, 
And so where I can, I'm gonna step in. And I really want to challenge white folks in the audience to think hard about the kind of heartbreak we've heard from our people of color, the kind of, hey, you're not there yet, that people of color in our congregations, especially black and indigenous folks, and especially our Muslim siblings, are telling us like, hey, you're using our stuff and you're not actually showing up for me. So white folks, let's get it together. Thanks, friends. So the next thing I want to do is invite you into a period of dialogue just about how is race impacting your spiritual life right now? And I, I invite you to dialogue so you can be a little bit more responsive here. Uh, we don't have to just go down the uh, line. Cool. I love that everybody's looking at me. This is great. <laughs> Renwa, you're our leader now. Well, I will, you know, uh, I think some of what has, um, the, what has resonated with me, particularly Vanessa and Casey, what I appreciated was this acknowledgement of um, the fact that we've done a lot of work and Charlie, you explicitly calling out some of the things that are still happening. Um, one of the phrases that goes through my head nonstop these days comes from the Quran where uh, there's a verse that says, through hardship there is also ease. Mm -hmm. And I feel like so many of us that are Unitarian Universalists of color are just pushing and pushing and mm -hmm. pushing. And now we're at a place where things are breaking open and maybe this is our ease and our white folks do more right. of the work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I noticed that is in common between my UU communities and my pagan communities is a, a tendency for white folks to overstep. Uh, a tendency for white folks to say, oh, well, but I'm not straight cis white Christian, so I'm not the problem. Um, and there's a lot of like, let me take on stuff that's yours. So I've noticed that we've been saying ashe a lot, and listen, I'm gonna leave it to people of color to make that decision, but white folks, how about we don't say that on our own? Because it doesn't belong to us. I want us to contextualize stuff, and I know in pagan communities there's a bad habit of being like, oh, well this Hindu goddess is mine, without any attachment to Hindu community. So if you're not meaningfully in community, be careful about what you're using. I also identify as pagan, and like you said, it's a predominantly white like religious practice. Yeah. And um, I think it's hard to seek out spaces where you can worship the way you want to, but still feel comfortable because we do have people like appropriating stuff that's not for us, and I have been guilty of that. Mm -hmm. That's right, black people can appropriate other cultures. Um, and I feel like it is for all of us to unlearn. We all have tendencies that we need to work on. I do, we all do. Um, but I feel like as you use, that's a door opener for us. It should be mm -hmm. a pathway. It makes it easier. I'm still thinking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll connect to something that um, Casey you mentioned about being in relationship too. Um, you know, as a UU Muslim, uh, I will always harp on how much we love "Come, Come, Whoever You Are" because <laughs> it's it's a beautiful song, and if we're not actively engaging in the Muslim and Islamic theologies it draws upon, mm -hmm. are we, we're appropriating it. Yeah. We're appropriating the words of a Sufi Muslim and not engaging with that particular faith tradition. And that for me is actually reflective of a culture of white supremacy, where we are picking the pieces that are a good fit for our faith and ignoring the context and the culture and the peoples that it's coming from. And when we encounter those pieces, it makes us uncomfortable. Yeah. So that's, that's something that I've also really experienced. Absolutely. And it's the case that each of us comes from a particular context, and we can, in relationship, learn and grow so much. And it's not that you can't have access to the wisdom. Mm -hmm. right? It's not that you can't get there. It's that you have to have a real relationship. And it has to be expanding for everybody and not expanding for you and narrowing 
for everyone else. Uh, I think it's also very interesting what you said, uh, come, come, whoever you are. And uh, I remember NGA last year, uh, where during one of the services, she said, we all love that song, especially the lovers are leaving part when things get difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. so that's really important to recognize is that, uh, that being able to show up and that being able to stay when the, when the things get difficult and not just leave because it doesn't quite fit your ideal or it doesn't, you think that, oh, I'm not the person that they're speaking to. Everything that's said, even if you are doing everything right, uh, can you can learn from that, and you can you can be able to sharpen uh, what it is that you're doing within your communities, and really ensuring that folks are getting that. It's, it's no good if you're the only person walking around woke. Uh, you have to go out and give that to other people, uh, and and ensure that you call them out when things are are said and done that's not appropriate. Absolutely. Well. We're coming to that time where we need to close down, but before we go, I'd like to invite you to give us a one sentence takeaway on your experience of race and spiritual practice as informed by this General Assembly. <laughs> Do not look at me like that. I will look at you. Yeah. I will look at you with all kinds of love. <laughs> one sentence. <laughs> Yeah, it can be a run on. It's fine. Lots I, of commas and clauses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But make it like a, a 15 second sentence. Okay. Give me a sec. Don't, no, I'll don't go don't first. The runner doesn't no, have to. No, no. I'm looking that way. <laughs> okay, one sentence. Um, we have a lot of growing left to do, and the people with the most power need to be ready to be wrong and uncomfortable out of love. I'm still here, here in this faith because I believe that you can do this work. We're almost there. We're so close. That's what I want to say. We're almost there, you guys. I'll give you another Quranic verse. Uh, humanity transgresses when we think we are self-sufficient. We need each other, and we need those forces greater than us to keep moving forward in this work. Yes. Let's have a final round of applause for all of our panelists. Thank you. They are awesome, awesome, awesome sauce. Before we move into a brief discussion about establishing a study commission, so Greg, don't go too far away, I want to uh, offer a leadership development public service announcement. If someone could make an acronym for me, that would be helpful. Um, this year, as we were putting, as the board was putting together uh, the plans for our general sessions, we talked a lot about different ways to do it, to share the space a little bit more. And when the idea of the tri-moderators came up, I was a little tiny bit nervous. If you know anything about the rules of procedure, if you know anything about Robert's Rules of Order, and if you know anything about Unitarian Universalists, it's a, it's a powerful cocktail of things mixed together. And our tri-mods worked very hard to figure out how to make this work. And despite my old lady white uh, misgivings, I sort of stepped back and they, they did everything they needed to. And the lesson here, for those of you in congregational leadership, in youth group leadership, in young adult leadership, 
wherever you find yourself leading, the best way to lead, I have learned, is to step back and trust those who are leading from the front edge. And that's what I think our tri-moderators have done. Several of you have asked me about responsive resolutions, and I said, I don't know. Talk to the tri-moderators. And they have handled it beautifully. And I am so, we are all so appreciative of your generosity of spirit and rolling with us through this work um, and giving us all of the positive feedback that you have. So big, big hearts out to all of you who have been patient and participatory and hopefully have learned a little something from the modeling of these three folks. So now I'm going to ask Greg to come back and talk a little bit about our study commission. And I'll invite us to do a little housekeeping quickly. So if you're a delegate in the house, I may have you raise your voting card right now. Excellent. So as a reminder, it is difficult for your tri-moderators to see outside of these kind of first four sections. There's a lot of empty seats kind of in this section here and a lot in this section here. If you can move in a little bit easier, uh, it will make it uh, easier for us to scan the room when we're doing an official vote. So if you have some time right now, just uh, move in, make new friends. Um, you can still leave a seat or two in between folks if you need to, but you know, there's, there's enough space. So I thank you for that. Our bylaws anticipate that promises need to be revisited from time to time. And that's exactly what our principles, sources, purposes are. They're promises, they're a covenant among our congregations in association. And so to avoid becoming a creed we are required to revisit all of Article 2 at least once every 15 years. We can do that much more frequently if we'd like, um, and we've tried a few times. We tried about five years ago, um, most recently, and, or maybe nine years ago, it was a little bit longer than that. And we obviously began some great conversations with the bylaw amendment proposals um, in the past few days and in the months leading up to that. So the conversation began when the congregation said, hey, we should get this to the agenda. It sounds to me and it sounds to your board like we really wanna have a conversation about who we are to one another who we are inside of our congregations, and who we are for everyone else in the world. To that end, again, we're required to do this at least once every 15 years. We did not establish a study commission um, yesterday. We thought we might, we thought we might, and well, maybe that's not the full truth. We briefly established a study commission and then said we didn't need it. <laughs> That's what we actually did. We, we had that four-fifths vote, so we, we established the study commission, and then it went out of existence almost as quickly. Article 15.1 of our bylaws allows your board of trustees, which is, in fact, the General Assembly in between General Assemblies. That's who we are. We're all of you. We're all of your congregations in association to establish a study commission at any point and mandates that the commission must be established if it's been longer than 15 years. So we're gonna do that. Because we really wanna have some conversations about who we are right now, and we've been doing such great work with the Renewing Covenant Task Force that it's a really great time to start thinking about what are some of the different potentials we have? What if? What if who we said we are wasn't part of our bylaws? What if it existed in a different theological document that wasn't subject to up and down voting? How do you feel about that? Do you think that the best way to be in covenant is to vote on the covenant using Robert's Rules of Order? 
we don't think so either, but it's time to start having a conversation about that because once upon a time we did. That's why we did it. That's why it lives in our bylaws right now. We used to have different principles. Have you read our 1961 bylaws? We used to have a totally different view of what we were supposed to do. We said part of our mission was to make sure we were growing more congregations. That's what our 1961 bylaws say. We're gonna go out there and make more Unitarian Universalist congregations. By 1985, I guess we thought we had enough. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure why that one disappeared, but it did. <laughs> but we got new and cleverer language that and invited us to draw from sources of a living tradition and gave us principles that applied those sources of our living tradition and then went one further and said, all of these things we agree to, if you don't really believe that, you don't have to. That, that's what 2.3 says, Article 2.3. That's your freedom of belief clause. If, it, if there's anything that is morally objectionable in the rest of Article 2, you don't have to do that. So these are conversations conversations we want to start. Um, I'm going to invite you for just a second to turn to someone near you, preferably someone you don't necessarily know. What are some of the conversations you would like us to have about our identity? I'm going to give you three minutes to do this. Three minutes. What are conversations you want to have about our identity? Let's begin wrapping up our conversations. I'm really excited by the energy I hear. Wonderful. So this is the work that a study commission can do. <laughs> 
They're gonna invite us into deeper conversation. The study commission itself doesn't hold the only conversations. As a matter of fact, the mandate requires that they do broad outreach to all of our congregations. Wouldn't it be awesome if every time we made decisions, we made sure that we reached out to every single congregation, not only the ones that can show up? We're gonna do that. It's gonna take a year or two or four, says the former moderator corner. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a moment. <laughs> but we're going to take some time to do this and do it right and make sure that before it's time to make the decision, we've had enough time to get all the voices, all the voices heard, so that we know that it's a decision that we want to make together. Thank you so much, Greg. I would like to invite, before we get to the President's Volunteer Service Award, I'd like to invite to the stage our Director of Stewardship and Development, Reverend Mary Catherine Moore, and we have some really exciting things that we would like to share with you. I'm going to tell you the good news first, and then Reverend Mary Catherine is going to tell us the really good news. Our collections at GA this year, first of all, the Living Tradition Fund collected $89,000. The collection for Standing on the Side of Love netted $28,972. The Katie Tyson Fund brought us $13,565. And this morning's service, the collection for Flick brought us $105,000. You all are simply amazing. In total, we raised 200, over $236,500 dollars in those collections. But wait, there's more. <laughs> oh, friends, it's a joy to see you, to look out after this tender week together. I want to share that it has truly been an honor and a privilege for me, a longtime parish minister, uh, to leave that work I love and join our UUA in this work in stewardship and development, a personal and a professional privilege to serve in this way. And, and I want to add that in particular, it has been a privilege for me this last year, since October, and particularly these last few months, truly. My faith and my heart have been broken open. Yours? Amen. By the pain and the brokenness, by the vision and the courage, by the promise and the practice of our faith. I feel such gratitude for our leaders, our co-presidents, the leaders of Blue, and so many others. And I take to heart the message from our co-presidents yesterday that they hope we will express our gratitude through a call to service, understand ourselves as being called to service for all of us to stay engaged with the work of dismantling and ending white supremacy inside and outside our faith. As you heard, 
On Friday, from our co-presidents, our board is inviting you to be a part of the promise and practice of our faith, an opportunity for every Unitarian Universalist congregation to support our board's commitment to providing $5.3 million in funding for Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism and to be part of a new way, and to be part of a new way, a transformed and transforming Unitarian Universalism where all are cherished. I am thrilled to be working with the board on this. The future of our faith depends on it, and it will take every one of us to be part of this work. This afternoon, it is my privilege and my joy to announce that we have received a $1 million gift to challenge every Unitarian Universalist and every UU congregation to be part of this campaign. I'm so glad to see some of you standing. I will give you a chance to clap again. I'm glad to see you standing because I think that means that you understand that it will take all of us. Every gift matters, no matter what size, and it is a privilege and a joy to give. Brad and Julie Bradbird have been Unitarian Universalists for over 60 years. They have been showing up for justice for all these decades. Racial justice has always been their passion, and they want us to do better. They told me this, we are charged with healing our broken world and our broken souls. This is an opportunity we have to achieve this repair and rejuvenation for our faith so that we can do the work we are called to do. Brad and Julie are inviting all of us, every Unitarian Universalist, every congregation, to experience the privilege and the joy of giving. During this year, we hope your congregation will join us in action and support. You will be receiving details soon about this. Dear ones, Unitarian Universalist leaders, have issued a call for us. In a sense, it is simply a call for us to live our faith. I want to thank our leaders, the Blue Collective and their executive director, Lena Gardner. The board and our co-presidents and our new president, the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray. And now I do hope you will join me in thanking Brad and Julie Bradbird for their faith in us, for their generosity, and for their challenge because together we will live into the promise of our faith. more joy right here. Once again, it gives me an enormous amount of pleasure to welcome our outgoing three co-presidents for the presentation of the President's Annual Award for Volunteer Service.
This is truly an honor. The co-president presenting the volunteer service to UUA is given to the person or organization designated by the co-presidents as having given extraordinary and vital service to the UUA as, organ as an organization. The co-presidents are proud this year to recognize Black Lives Unitarian Universalists. Also, There is more. <laughs> Blue has given us what we call a movement moment. And with the movement moment, it's where black people can have our own sense of space as Unitarian Universalists. Blue is not as Reverend William Barber describes as a collective with a one moment mentality. No, Blue is about building a beloved community for all. Blue, Blue exemplifies resistance in love, truth and justice. The Blue Collective is a movement that emerged from the pews to the streets. Blue is truly a movement that is deep, very deep into the spiritual work of dismantling white supremacy, structures, and culture. Blue challenges our faith to live our principles and purposes and to make them evident in everything we do in moving towards the beloved community. Blue has challenged us to look at white supremacy within. Spirit asks us to be unifiers, justice makers, and to sow, not to sow division among groups of people such as the aim of white supremacy. In a one person or one group of people who in an effort to dismantle supremacist culture, they're doing spiritual work. Blue does spiritual work. Blue has challenged and they have supported us to look at the white supremacy within. To quote Blue, getting there will be uncomfortable and messy and impolite, just as work for justice has always been. The Black Lives of UU Organizing Collective believes strongly in the promises of Unitarian Universalists. Blue's programming, community organizing work, intense and joyful worship, and their hard discussions, all of these have opened for us possibilities of the reality of what Unitarian Universalism can be. On behalf of the president, I'd like to present the citation. This is the President's Award 2017. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Will you look at Nancy for us? Will you look at Nancy for us? Just join us.
Just deep gratitude for this service award. And I particularly want to lift up the team and also know we're missing someone who couldn't be with us. Her name is Leslie McFadden. So we'll clap for her. And I just want to honor Dr. Takia Amin, Dr. Royce James, Reverend Michael Slack. and Kenny Wiley. And I just want to lift up that this work has been a blessing to us and a, and a burden. We have put in so many hours and we will continue to put in that work. That is our pledge and our commitment and our promise to you. And I want to express deep gratitude to our co-president. Not, not only for this award and this recognition, but for the work they have put into our denomination collectively. Because it is on their shoulders that we stand and in their shadows that we work and are able to do this work. So with deep gratitude, we accept this and receive this and commit to continuing to live more deeply into our faith values. I think that might deserve a little singing. What do you say? Let's sing. I hear you. <laughs> well, good afternoon, GA. Are we having a good time? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It seems that this GA has been so important to us all because we're not standing on the side of love. We're answering the call of love. Toward that end, one of our favorite songs has gotten a makeover, and I'd like to ask the composer, the Reverend Jason Shelton, to come on up and talk to you about it and lead you in singing, answering the call of love. Reverend Shelton? Are you? Oh, here he is. Good afternoon, friends. Sometimes we build a barrier to keep tight love tightly bound. Sometimes our words themselves are the barrier. The metaphors that we use for the work of justice matter. If we are called to be in this work together, then we have to understand when our words become barriers to full participation. What does love call us to do? For some, it is standing on the side of love. For some, standing is not an option. And the continued use of that metaphor is a painful reminder of the barriers to full inclusion of people with disabilities in our congregations and especially at our general assemblies. So what is my responsibility as an artist when awareness of this pain comes into my consciousness, finally? I'm clear, I am clear, that the standing on the side of love metaphor, as I intended it, as I heard it reflected from Bill Sinkford, has nothing to do with the physical act of standing. It's about aligning ourselves with what love calls us to do. But I'm also clear that intent is not the same thing as impact. And the impact of this metaphor has become a barrier for some among us. Friends, when love calls, it sometimes asks us to let go of our attachments and maybe even our t-shirts. Now, now, I'm not sure what to do about those t-shirts. I never got a cut of that anyway. We can have a conversation about that. But I do know that love is calling us to a new and deeper awareness, and I can do something about the song that I wrote. So I ask you to rise not in body, 
but to truly rise in spirit, mindful of all that that might mean for you, and join me in answering the call of love. of the Spirit, faith, hope, and love abide, and so every soul is blessed and made whole, the truth in our hearts is our guide, we are answering the call of love, hands joined together. As hearts beat as one, emboldened by faith, we dare to proclaim we are answering the call of love. Sometimes we build a barrier to keep love tightly bound, corrupted by fear. Unwilling to hear, denying the beauty we found. We are answering the call of love. Hands joined together as hearts beat as one. Emboldened by faith, we dare to proclaim we are answering the call. When love will not divide Reflections of grace In every embrace Fulfilling the vision divine We are answering the call of love Hands joined together As hearts beat as one Emboldened by faith, we dare to proclaim we are answering the call of love. We are answering the call of love. The call of Thank you so much, Jason. Wasn't it good to sing together? Now we get to engage in yet another spiritual practice of decision making. Now again, polity is theology. It's a, one of the ways that we express our living tradition. We say that we make decisions together that bind us and commit us to action. And so that's exactly what we're doing with responsive resolutions. Resolutions. Responsive resolutions are intended to respond to a substantive part of any report that has been presented to the General Assembly. Today we have three that will come before us. Some important things to know about responsive resolutions is they are binding only on the delegates of this General Assembly. They commit you to uh, the specific actions in them, and when they direct action to the board, they're, they're more informative uh, necessarily than their directive. So, so keep that in mind. They require a two-thirds vote in order to be adopted by the General Assembly. And the very first thing we're going to do is add them onto the agenda. So if you have not had a chance to look over the responsive resolutions, we do not have them in paper form. They are available on your app. Um, they are also available electronically at the website. So I'll give you a second to bring them up if you don't already, if you're not already looking at them. Maybe you've printed them off, you're allowed to print them off yourself, that's fine.
I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Uh, yes, please. Uh, Carl Pononen from the uh, Unitarian Universalist Church of Greater Lansing. I remember it at that time. Um, uh, just as a point of personal privilege, um, many of us um, don't carry these uh, expensive electronic devices around. Some of us can't afford them uh, in, in the, the budget we have, or we have other priorities uh, with the small amount of money that we have. Is there some way that, that these can be made accessible for, for the rest of us? I can even give you a, a dollar or two if it'll cover the cost of printing. Okay, no, just hang some of the way. So we are working to put them on the screen. So there's three, remember? So all three can't go on the screen at the same time. All righty, so just give a moment so they can have time to read and then the next one will come. Is that okay? Yeah. I read very quickly, thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's not four, there are three. Yes, there are only three. Uh, one has been withdrawn. It, it was one that directed a similar action as another one of the responsive resolutions. The, the only ones that you will find on the website or in the app are the three. If you have a question, I need you to come to the microphone. Are there questions? I hear yelling, but I don't hear questions. So there are four. One is going to be withdrawn because it's similar to the other. That's the thing one and two. Hi. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Oops. Sally Geller, Central Unitarian Church, Paramus, New Jersey. I apologize. I was coming to ask the question. I thought you were answering it. Uh, which a point of information, which uh, resolution has been withdrawn. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The, there were two resolutions submitted regarding an eighth principle um, study commission. There were two that asked for the creation of a study commission. When the board said it was going to create one, the one that did not reference the eighth principle but just wanted updating, that one was withdrawn. Okay. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. To clarify, to help you all, because you all aren't on your devices up there, on the app, there are four. One is highlighted in yellow. I'm going to make an assumption that that is the one that has been withdrawn. No. Can I'm you give us the no. title? I absolutely will. Yes, yes, that's actually true. <laughs> it says, Amendment to Study Commission to Review and Possibly Propose Updates to the Principle yes. and Purposes yes. in Article, yes. and it is highlighted in yes. yellow. Yes. It is page three. So if you're looking on the app, on mine, it is page three, it's highlighted in yellow. That is the one that has been withdrawn. Yes. Excellent. Could the delegate please introduce herself? Christina Rivera, uh, Director of Administration and Finance at uh, the Congregation in UU Charlottesville and on the Board of Trustees. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. My name is Pat Eggenberger, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Stanislaw County. Um, I was not able to get it big enough. Uh, I'm visually impaired, and I was not able to make it big enough on my application. I tried to turn it sideways, and I still couldn't get it big enough. I can't read it on the screen. So in the future, I would like you to have some copies available for the visually impaired. Okay, so we're, we're learning together, and we, we are learning about the limitations and the complex balance between environmental sustainability and accessibility, especially when it comes to vision. We, we erred on one side, and we knew that might be an issue. So we, we are doing our best to address this in the moment. Um, what I would suggest is that if you have printed out copies and you have large printed them, if you could share them with someone who maybe doesn't have it and would like to have it in paper format, you can review them together. We are also putting them up on the screen. We'll give about 
let's do two minutes on each one, and then we'll, we'll continue. Okay, so right now we're reading uh, Combating um, Escalating Inequality. Let's make that full screen, please. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're going to read it out loud for people who cannot see it, since I'm one who needs giant type too. <clears throat> Whereas Tom Andrews of the UUSC said that he cannot think of a time when UU values were more under attack than they are today. Whereas Mr. Andrews exhorted us to take vigorous and sustained action to protect and further those values, Whereas the delegates of this 2017 General Assembly approved a statement of conscience regarding escalating economic inequality, whereas the causes of escalating inequality intersect with the effects of white supremacy, therefore, be it resolved that the 2017 General Assembly calls on the UUA Board of Trustees and UUA staff to appoint a committee to help coordinate, strategize, and advise congregations on how to address effectively these deep-seated cultural issues. All righty? That was that one. Check one. Next. <laughs> so can we, oh, perfect, okay. okay. Appointment of a study commission to consider adding an eighth principle to Article Two, Principles and Purposes, Section C-2.1. Whereas the interim co-president's report and the report of the Board of Trustees both address the issues of white supremacy and intersecting forms of oppression, and whereas the delegates of the 2017 General Assembly believe that such issues are sufficiently important to be specifically addressed in the UUA bylaws, principles, and purposes. Therefore, be it resolved that the delegates to the 2017 General Assembly call for the board to appoint a study commission to discuss adding an eighth principle that may be stated as below. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote, journeying towards spiritual wholeness by building a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. And here's the third one. Making the standing on the side of love campaign more inclusive. Whereas the Journey to Wholeness Transformation Committee report identifies Unitarian Universalism as a movement has made progress in anti-oppression work, but still has work to do. Whereas, part of the work we Unitarian Universalists need to do is make our justice campaign standing on the side of love more inclusive. Whereas, use of the word standing as default language, justice language, places a high value on the justice work and commitments of able-bodied people, while it makes invisible and excludes the justice work of people with a wide range of disabilities and autistic people. Whereas Unitarian Universal's principles call for justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, and whereas our faith calls us to consider the impact of our words and to take action and engage with ableism in the creation of a beloved community, therefore be it resolved that the 2017 General Assembly calls upon the leaders of the UUA standing on the side of love campaign to create a new imagining that better image includes and reflects the needs and contributions of disabled people. Thank you, Tri Moderator Alandria, for a compassionate compromise. I recognize the off site delegate at the procedural mic. This question is from Alan Lindrup, First Unitarian Society of Chicago. Are responsive resolutions open to amendment, or must they be voted up or down as initially written? 
they are open for amendment after an initial period of conversation has elapsed. Uh, in our rules, we have allotted 15 minutes for that or until no one else is standing at the microphones off-site or in uh, person. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Hello, Jackie Phelps of the, Unit the bleh, UU Fellowship of Lafayette, Louisiana. Um, I'm told this is a point of privilege. As a person with a disability, um, I would suggest we change autistic people to people with autism. And disabled people as either people with disabilities or diff people who are differently abled. The disability or condition does not define who the person is. So that's not, that is helpful information. It's not quite a point of personal privilege uh, that those were moving amendments. I, I know, I know, I know. That, that's, it's the ruling of the chair, not, not necessarily the tellers, all right? So the ruling of the chair is that that's not a point of personal privilege. Um, when the time is appropriate, we could make it an amendment, and the chair might be inclined to believe that that is a clarifying amendment uh, rather than a substantive change based on um, contemporary language. So we'll, we'll see what happens when we get there. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Good afternoon, moderator Greg. <laughs> I have a point of information. I'm Deborah Boyd from the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Columbus, Ohio, and a member of the General Assembly Planning Committee. We have a limited number of copies of the responsive resolutions. So if those folks who truly um, cannot share with their neighbor and, and this is a necessary piece, we have those in the hall. So. Where would we be able to find those? In my hand. All right. <laughs> So folks who do need a paper copy, if you're able to make it toward the front, or it looks like we have some folks I raising their hands. I will hand deliver. All right, the, they will be hand delivered. Before I recognize the next delegate at the procedural mic, I want to remind you that we have not yet added these to the agenda, and so we're not <laughs> even having the conversation on the response to resolutions of sales. Well, well it, it depends on, do we want to take action on these responsive resolutions? Yeah, okay, so we have to do another thing first. All right, so you can stay there, you can stay there, you don't have to go away. Is there, is there another procedural question that does not deal directly with the things we already want to discuss? Okay, so let's first, add the three responsive resolutions that you've had a chance to read or have read to you. Um, Deborah is still making some um, rounds. Deborah is all finished making those rounds. I'm getting a signal. And so we're going to add these to the agenda. That takes a simple majority vote. And I'm going to give our tech deck a little time to tee up the off-site delegates uh, to whom I owe an apology. Uh, yesterday, I said something indelicate um, and inappropriate that we could determine a majority just by the folks that were in the hall. And that was experienced by some of our off-site delegates as dismissive and in, made them feel like their votes don't count. Every delegate's vote counts, and I am deeply sorry for the pain that I caused by indicating that the on-site delegate vote was in more important than the off-site delegate vote. We do not make decisions without uh, consulting the entire vote. And to the off-site delegates, I also want you to know that your votes are archived because they're electronic. And so we have um, more control, so we can always go back and revisit your votes in a way that we don't have the same ability to do inside the hall. So I want you to know that not only do your votes matter, um, but that we can, we can experience them differently if we need to. I am sorry.
Okay, so let's get our voting cards out. Offsite delegates, let's get ready. Um, all those in favor of adding the three responsive resolutions to our agenda, please indicate by raising your delegate cards now. Can I have some help from my tri-moderators in determining this? All those opposed to adding the responsive resolutions to the agenda, indicate so by raising your voting card now. Please close the queue for the off-site delegates. Off-site delegate vote. That clearly passes. All right. So now we have some responsive resolutions to discuss. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Tri-Moderator Elandria, who will be taking, in order, we will go with standing on the side of love first, combating income inequality, or uh, escalating uh, income inequality, and then uh, the eighth principle one. And we have someone at the procedural mic. <laughs> So before we get there, I want to remind you of a statement I said yesterday. If we can repeat it after me, impact over grammar. Impact over grammar. So responsive resolutions, one more time. We are talking about the context of the resolution, what it means in all of its ways, not the exact words, not the words we might use, but what it's saying as a whole. Are we on the same page? Great. So I want to remind us yet again, 15 minutes conversation. If no one stands at the mics for five minutes because they're ready to go, after five minutes of discussion, we can vote and we will have more time. So here's what I would love people to do. Have people read the Standing on the Side of Love campaign? Inclusive. We've said it out loud. We're going to start the clock. Take two minutes and just talk to your neighbor about what this means for you. Two minutes. Talk to your neighbor about what it means for you, and then we're gonna ask people to come to the pro mic, the I have an additional change mic, and if there's any procedural. Hi, Sally Jane. How are you? All right. All righty. So I want to make two announcements to begin with. First, if you want to do an amendment, there are amendment forms are coming, and please stop by the tech deck right the, the amendment table right here and let them know in advance so that they can type it up all righty that's one 
And two, someone asked yesterday, and we forgot to say it, that the, when we see the off-site delegates, that's the off-site delegates. That's not you all. It's not percentages of who's in the House here. It's the percentages of the de off-site delegates. All righty? All righty. So I recognize, well, maybe. Okay. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Thank you, Madam Tri Moderator. My name is Reverend Teresa Ines Soto. I am the. <laughs> Thank you, friends. I am the interim minister at our UU congregation in Flint, Michigan. I am here to offer this resolution that we, as a movement, and especially this UUA administration, consider a period of reflection for renaming our justice campaign, Standing on the Side of Love. Some people will say, hey, that's a really good slogan. Are you getting rid of it? Don't you know it's a metaphor? But I want us to call to mind the words of Universalist theologian, Louis Fisher, Louis Fisher Beals. He said this, People often ask where universalists stand on this issue or that. But the only true answer to this question is that we do not stand, we move. Today, with this resolution, we can consider how to broaden our welcome, how to value all kinds of work and all kinds of bodies. And General Assembly, today I'm asking you to rise up, to move toward this kind of action. Thank you. I love you. I recognize the delegate of the procedure mic, offside delegate. Offside delegate Marietta Tubman from UU Fellowship of Redwood City in California. Can someone explain, I believe she's asking a point of information. Okay. Can someone explain why autism is singled out and how it relates standing on the side being exclusionary language? So, Teresa, would you like to answer the question? Teresa is going to answer the question. She's coming back up. They are coming back up. Thank you, friends, for this question. It comes directly from community. People with autism have said, don't call us that like you would people with disabilities. Don't call us people with autism because it's part of us, like our hair or our eye color. And we want to be known as having this with us all the time. Now, uh, the difference is that when you see me in my scooter, you know I have a physical disability. Often I have to advocate for myself to be treated as a person. If your disability is different, then that person piece might not be appropriate for you. But I'm, the reason I'm using that language specifically is because that's what people have asked for. I recognize the delegate at the con mic. My name is Michael Scott. I am a delegate from the First Universalist Church of <laughs> Rochester, New York. As an able-bodied white male, I approach the microphone with considerable trepidation. As a lover of poetry and religious language, however, I am afraid. Afraid that almost any metaphor of human interaction with the world will speak to abilities that not all people share, since it is with our senses and our bodies that we all interact with the world. Open my eyes that I may see Lift up mine eyes unto the hills, but what if I cannot see? Now the ears of my ears awake, but what if I cannot hear? Women who run with the wolves, but what of those who cannot run? We just sang a beautiful new view version of Jason Shelton's inspiring hymn, but still we sang of hands joined together on a bright new day. What of those who lack hands, or for whom the brightness as a metaphor for good is an echo of white supremacy? I do not want in any way to belittle the pain that language so frequently causes. And again, I am very conscious of being myself in the privileged group. But I ask that we consider the possibility that prioritizing inclusiveness 
may sometimes undermine our ability to powerfully articulate our faith. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. I'm the Reverend Suzanne Fast, community minister affiliated with the Unitarian Universalist Church of Fort Myers, Florida, and the most recent president of Equal Access. I speak in support of this proposed responsive resolution. The problem is not simply about othering and that the effect that has on me and so many people, although that effect is real and I would have thought that alone would be sufficient reason to change it. But it is also about structural ableism and reinforcing attitudes that able or normative bodies and minds are superior to the rest of us. Our faith's public witness campaign should be a leader in confronting structural oppression, and instead we have been justifying it. This week we have been celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Women in Religion Resolution, a resolution which in its content called for uh, looking at the language, re-examining the language that we use because it perpetuated um, uh, sexism. Now is the time for us to begin to do this work about ableism. Is there a delegate at the procedure mic? I recognize a delegate at the procedure mic. My name is James Merrill. I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura, and I understood the explanation of why the term autistic people was used in that order, and I understood the, the logic of wanting not to be included with other people with disabilities. I still do not understand, and I would like a clarification of the language or the rationale. Why can't, why are autistic people listed at all? Because autism has nothing to do with the ability to stand or not. My autistic daughter is perfectly capable of standing and I don't understand the inclusion there. I recognize the delegate of the pro mic. Thank you for this question. One of the things that we are examining as we dig in here is the fact that it's not just about standing or sitting. When I tell you that, I promise that it's true. One, one of the things that this language reinforces is the hierarchy in which able bodies are fantastic and disabled bodies are okay. And that's if we get that. In the way that the labor and the activism and the support of autistic people is devalued and dehumanized within our movement, that's why we're together in community on this. I recognize the delegate of the procedure mic. Yes, my name's Erin White from Fourth Universalist Society in the city of New York. Um, and my question is a, a further point of clarification, specifically around, um, I do understand the, the argument uh, and explanation appreciated of why the phrase autistic people um, instead of people with autism but I don't understand still why specifically autistic people are, are named here and not people with other types of invisible disabilities. Um, as a person who has post-traumatic stress disorder, that often affects my ability to participate uh, in justice-oriented actions. And so, um, unless we're gonna name everyone that has invisible disabilities, I, I wanna understand why just one type. Alrighty, I recognize the delegate of the Pro Mic. There was a question. There was a procedural question. Thank you for that question. The language that I use to indicate this is a wide range of disabilities. I think that a feasible amendment is to include specifically the word non apparent or invisible. But that's why it says a wide range, because it's not just about one kind or another. I, you know I can't hear you, so you have to actually come back to the mic. I reckon as a delegate of the procedure. Uh, yes, Aaron White again from Fourth U. Um, so I, I, 
I really don't want to belabor the point. I just um, do want to understand why one specific type of um, disability was, was named when others are not. Because I, I think it's mm -hmm. exclusionary to folks who have others. Um, and I, I, I feel that way about it. And so I think the suggestion was maybe to do a friendly amendment. Okay, okay, because I just didn't understand that, that to be that was one of the suggestions. answer. But okay, yeah. thank you. I will do that. Right. Okay, I recognize the delegate at the con mic. My name is Reverend Finley C. Campbell with the First Unitarian Church Christian Group. I am not fellowshipped by UUMA, but I am fellowshipped by UUCF. I call for the rejection of this amendment or resolution, not because I don't believe in love, but because we have not shown love to a brother who has been pained in more ways than one. We were told to look at the context. The context is about love. No love has been shown to my brother, Peter Morales, who made a simple or horrible mistake, however you want to call it, and was, in my opinion, driven from office by hateful and cruel language. So I'm How sorry. Can we speak this of is love actually out of order. Peter Morales so I'm has sorry. Been cut back, and I and that's honor all right. your opinion, but this is not about that. This is about if you have something you'd like to say about this particular responsive resolution, we would love to hear it. Okay. But I recognize the delegate, the pro mic. Thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is D Reverend Dawn Fortune, and I am the interim minister at a yoked uh, ministry in Greater St. Louis at the Emerson UU Chapel and at the First Unitarian Church of Alton, Illinois. My pronouns are they and them. I am genderqueer, and I am here representing Trust, the Transgender Religious Professional Unitarian Universalist, together. We officially endorse this responsive resolution written by one of our members and call on those gathered here to pass it. On Friday, we affirmed here in this hall that one of the sources of our UU principles is not only words and deeds of prophetic women and men, but words and deeds of prophetic people of all genders. I lost my place. Including non-binary non people. We affirmed that the intention of the wording Unitarian, of Unitarian Universalism's second source was to be inclusive, but that the yardstick had moved and that we are called now to a new affirmation and articulation of inclusivity. Now is the time for us to do the same thing with respect to the name of the most visible social justice campaign in our faith's history. Those who named the campaign did not intend to exclude people with disabilities, Yet for eight years, many people have spoken out about the harm and the hurt it does for such a powerful and prophetic campaign to have this name. On Friday, we answered the call of love to create more inclusivity by changing some really important words. Today, trust asks you to do that again. Vote to open a discernment process that will lead to a new name for the campaign that represents the best and brightest of our faith's justice efforts to one that truly embodies the values of this campaign. Honor the prophetic words and deeds of people of all genders who stand, walk, roll, and sit on the side of love. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedure mic. I'm Karen Griffin. Uh, I come from uh, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Venice in Venice, Florida. Um, I, I just have a point of question. This is a, a request for complete rebranding of a whole movement, uh, which is going to be cost money. Um, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just wondering who is financially liable for this? Um, is it the UUA? Is it the move, movement? Or, I mean, there's nothing in here that mentions uh, any, any of that responsibility. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, is it financially feasible for the movement to do this? So is there anybody here from the Stating on the Side of Love campaign? I can, no one can hear you. 
So if someone is talking, I need you to come to a mic if you have an answer to the question. Yes. Aland Alandria? Yes. Oh, is this on? there we go. Thank you, Elizabeth. Can you stand at the procedure mic and not the amendment mic, please? Thank you. I know. <laughs> Elizabeth went to the closest mic. Uh, appreciate Can all you please of... introduce yourself first? Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth Wynn, I do some interim work right now with Standing on the Side of Love as Spiritual Sustenance Advisor and very grateful for all of this conversation and deep work and your moderation, Alandria. Um, I'm afraid this is going to be an unsatisfying answer, which is that right now we are figuring out what we can say and commit to. Um, I will say that as Nora and I said, when we spoke about the campaign yesterday, was it just yesterday? Yesterday morning, we feel like a change in language is past overdue. We are trying to figure out what we can say right now, given our governance. I know that's not very satisfying. Thank you. I recognize it like their procedure mic. Reverend Madeline Campbell, I serve as interim minister of Bull Run Unitarian Universalists. I am speaking as a member of the board of the Unitarian Universalist Christian Fellowship. As a point of personal privilege and clarification, we do not offer fellowship to ministers. Thank you. So I recognize the delegate at, at the con mic, offside delegate. Nope. All righty. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. So, oh, what? What am I missing? Oh, I thought you said no. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Carolyn. Madam Moderator, I'm Carolina Kravart Graham. I'm from the Church of the Larger the Fellowship, minutes, just that still people, um, right? and I am on the autism spectrum. It's, Initially, I, I came to oppose this resolution, but what, what, for, for I just feel it's not big enough. But one of the things I've learned here at this General Assembly is how white supremacy seeks to divide communities of color. As a white ally, I am often confused as to which leadership of color I should be following. And just what I've heard in the last few minutes, it is very, very clear to me that the leadership of Asia Hauser and um, Christina Rivera and the leaders in Drum and whatever are the people who are leading this movement within Unitarian Universalism. I just want to say, I know I'm not kind of saying what I was going to say when I got up here, but I just want to say it's really, really clear to me who's leading this movement. So if that, if anyone was confused about that um, throughout this General Assembly, I just want to say it's clear to me. So. Are you, gonna, are you speaking to this amendment? I, I was speaking to the debate. Do you have something you'd like to say about this amendment? I, 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 I'm no longer opposing it. Oh, okay, great, thank you. <laughs> yes. I haven't gotten to make my amendment. I recognize the next person to speak from the pro mic. Um, so you've, I, I this can't. This is just a point of clarification. Okay. Um, there's concern that the outcome of the resolution should be a specific change, but really it's a greater imagining that we're seeking. So if that means, so if that, means that we enter a period of reflection, that would meet the request. Thank you. I recognize the delegate the pro mic. The next delegate of the pro mic. Hi, Meg Riley with the Church of the Larger Fellowship. Yes, to, uh and the founding campaign director of Standing on the Side of Love. Life calls us on, y'all. <laughs> Life calls us on. The tagline for Standing on the Side of Love is harnessing love's power to stop oppression, exclusion, and violence. So let's do that. So I would like to remind everyone 
Are you at the con mic? Okay. So I recognize the delegate at the con mic. Um, I will vote against this. Um, as a person who can't always go to, I'm sorry, my name is Marie Hauk. I'm from the Unitarian Universalist Church of Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, as a person who doesn't go to rallies and such because I can't count on my body uh, to be cooperative, but the literal definition of stand, there are 20 in Merriam-Webster, only one of which has to do with physical ability. I don't believe in this case stand is a metaphor I believe that it really means to take a stand, to take a position. Um, and I believe that spending time and money to change that language, to change the logo, to change the t-shirts is a waste of energy when we should be focusing on what we're actually doing. So there's been an ask if the people who are going to suggest amendments can come to the amendment table so they, they can be consolidated and want to work with, if that is okay. Thank you. Because we're almost there. So if you could, perfect. We got it? Okay. All righty. So I recognize the delegate of the pro mic. Hello, I'm the Reverend Barbara Myers from Mission Peak Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Fremont, California. I have been working with Equal Access and um, the, the wonderful people that were involved ever since it was formed, and I'm in charge of, uh, of establishing the Accessibility and Inclusion Ministry. I couldn't be prouder of the people that have spoken about taking action on, on making our, our social justice campaign more inclusive, and I encourage you to support it. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the con mic. Hi, I'm Jeff Stein from uh, Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville. I too, as a old white man, stand up here uh, with a lot of trepidation like the fellow before me. I am a writer. I have spent my life in communications. I am, as I've listened so much to this, I have been so supportive of everything metaphorically and actually, as the woman before me said, um, in terms of all the definitions of standing on the side of love have supported it. I am so concerned that we start to be picky about the choice of words that we start to get into the area of censorship, that we are going to be tiptoeing on eggshells constantly, that this is going to become a, as the woman again before me said, a large and divisive and continually waste of energy when the metaphors that we are living by and acting on are there. I live by metaphor, and I become concerned when my denomination starts to strike those metaphors down. So I recognize the delegate of their procedure, Mike. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I'm Carolina Kavard Graham. I'm from the Church of the Larger Fellowship. Um, I'm coordinating on and off-site delegates for Allies for Racial Equity, and I have some of our off-site delegates saying that there's a slight delay, and, and they'd like to know, I, I know that the tech team is a little short today, and, and we grieve. Um, whom do they contact about that delay on the ground? That was the question sent to me. So what I can do is just wait, pause, but go before we go. That I think would help. I'm hoping that will be sufficient. Thank Let's you so hope. much. Okay. So did everyone hear? Before we start, we need to pause before we go. I want to say one other thing about what it means to be doing this in a theological faith space. Everything we talk about actually impacts people in the room, right? So. This is what I want to say. You see, I'm sitting here on this nice chair. 
that I can't stand anymore, is that for everything we're going to discuss today, when we can, and I come from a culture that claps a lot. It does mean, though, that it actually could say to somebody whether they're valued or not, even in our clapping. So for us to really hold tight to what does it mean to love everybody in this space regardless, and so that we're not saying, yay, we believe in you, but not really for however people believe. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm not saying to not show your appreciation, but just hold that we are in a faith movement with each other. And that means we show up differently than maybe we should in other places, although I think we should show up the same way there too. So we're going to take a one second pause. And I recognize a delegate from the, hold on, Rep Pro, right? No, procedure mic. There you go, Matthew McHale. Thanks. Uh, yes, I am the Reverend Matthew McHale. Uh, I serve Emerson Unitarian Universalist Church in Los Angeles. And I have a question, which is, does this responsive resolution at, uh, say that we cannot use words like standing or looking or whatever the case may be in any case whatsoever? Or does it only ask us to rename uh, or to look at the possibility of renaming our justice campaign that so much of our justice work sit, uh, rests under. It is just about renaming the justice campaign that our work sits under. Great, then we should support it. <laughs> okay. Out of order. Out Goodness of order. gracious. So, are we at pro or con? Are we at pro or con? Or at con. I recognize the delegate from the con mic. Uh, Sally Gellert, Central Unitarian Church, Paramus, New Jersey. Um, I note that um, Serge had this conversation and we're told that standing up for racial justice was okay. Um, I also want to quote a lyric saying, um, sitting in and laying down are ways to take a stand. And also, twinkles work instead of using time to applaud. So I want to remind everybody that there are people that cannot hear well if everyone else is talking while they are. So if we can please make sure that everyone around us can hear at the same time. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Thank you. My name is Alex hader Winnett. I'm a delegate from the First Unitarian Church of Oakland in beautiful downtown Oakland, California. Okay. Thank you. And I'm a student at the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley. I approach the pro mic with an attitude of confession and contrition. From 2007 to 2009, I had the right, I had the privilege and honor to serve in the Washington office for advocacy. And one of the roles I took on was to help Meg with the launch team. Now in one of our early meetings, one of our members, Lisa Swanson, uh, a beloved colleague with uh, disabilities in their hands, mentioned that they thought that the language we were using was exclusionary and ableist. I dismissed their claims and ultimately went with the language as was proposed. I now realize that was wrong and I apologize. I do not believe that we were working out of ill faith or bad intent or malice, but rather through unchecked bias and I apologize for that as well. I'm incredibly proud of what we've accomplished in eight years. We've done so much with standing on the side of love, but I think it's time for us to reassess the language we use, the images, the metaphors, and take the courage to find new ways to be and answer the call of love. So I ask the delegation to call the question and support this proposal. Thank you. So I would like to make an announcement. We have 30 minutes to do all three of these. No, 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 hold on. If we're going to stay on time. Yes, yes. If we're going to stay on time, we have 30 minutes to do three responsive resolutions. Okay? So I'm just putting the announcement out there so that people know what time we're at and what we're looking at. Because sometimes, yet again, we forget timing. So, I recognize the delegate of the procedure, Mike. Thank you, Madam Trimod. 
Wendy Von Quarter uh, for a few more hours, chair, a co-chair of the Journey Toward Wholeness Transformation Team, delegate from Marblehead, Massachusetts, and a former member of the UUA Accessibilities Committee. Somebody asked the very good question about does language, this is for a point of clarification. Somebody asked about whether this language and focus on it detracts from our doing. Might we have a brief report from the equal access folks about how it is we're doing in terms of our accessibility sensitivities here at General Assembly? Thank you. I recognize the delegate the procedure mic. Thank you, Tri-Moderator. My name is Reverend Sunshine Jeremiah Wolf, and I am the Interim Minister at May Memorial Unitarian Universalist Society in Syracuse, New York. I offer a point of clarification that SURGE stands for showing Showing up for racial justice, not standing up. Showing up. I recognize the delegate to proceed your mic. My name is Reverend Jennifer Gray. I serve our congregation in Danville, Indiana, the UU Community Church of Hendricks County. And I'm looking at the two lines and I would like to call the question. Is there a second? Okay, so we are voting whether or not to vote on the question. So does everyone have their delegate cards ready? Yes. Here my fellow tri-mods. Help me. (laughs) This takes two thirds. So all of those in favor of voting on this responsive resolution now, please raise your cards. All those opposed? We're waiting on the final count. 96% in favor, 4% opposed on offline. It passes. All righty, so we're now going to vote. Now we're on the main motion. So here we go. We are now voting on the main motion. And there will be no amendments. All right, so all those in favor that the, the it resolved that the 2017 General Assembly call upon the leaders of the UA standing on the side of love campaign to create a new imagining that better includes and reflects the needs and contributions of disabled people. All those in favor, please raise your cards. All of those opposed? We're waiting on the offsite. Ninety percent to ten, it passes. Yeah. One thing done. Okay, we're going to go to combating income inequality, and I'm going to wait for the uh, offsite delegate queue to clear. And I'm going to recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Thank you. My name is Fred Van Dusen, and I'm a member of First Parish in Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, (laughs) I'm the author of this resolution. We have an active group in Concord that's been working on the topic of escalating inequality for the last three years. Uh, We're quite well grounded on these issues. It's abundantly clear to us that the issues of escalating inequality and white supremacy strongly intersect in their causes and concerns. They're together deeply ingrained in our American culture and need to be worked on together. It will require a huge and well-coordinated strategic effort to make any lasting progress on these issues. It will involve many groups working together effectively to build a large and powerful movement We need to mobilize and we need to start soon. It will be very difficult, if not impossible, to do this without credible, well-positioned leadership that's able to pull together the talent, ideas, and strategic relationships necessary to be successful. This week, we've been blessed to observe the ability of the UUA board and staff members 
to pull together three superb temporary co-presidents and many wonderful and knowledgeable speakers and leaders. I'm strongly convinced that if we focus our attention and work together on these critical issues in a well thought out, coordinated manner, we can make an enormous difference in this country. This work must be done and we all can play a major role if we have the courage to do so. I hope we're willing to step out of our comfort zones, I certainly am now, <laughs> and do this terribly important work. The work that we do externally will help us with the work we need to do internally. They're synergistic. I ask you to approve this resolution. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Peter Candace, UU Congregation of the Low Country in South Carolina. Um, I would ask the moderators uh, in another instance, if we have called the vote, to let the delegates know that we're then not going to be able to vote on the amendments. I think that may, that may well influence the vote. Thank you. So noted. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Hi, it's Karen Griffin again from Venice, Florida. Um, I have a question um, on this uh, uh, proposal. Um, I, I'm still concerned that we are not addressing the issues of the cultural biases in our own congregations when it comes to in, uh, income inequity. And um, I, is this uh, work that you're asking uh, a commission to lead on uh, ex externally focused or also internally focused to deal with our own cultural biases uh, within our congregations? Uh, I recognize the, the delegate at the pro mic to answer the question. Yeah, it's Fred Van Dusen again. Um, I think we're pretty well focused. This is meant to be both, actually. In a sense, I think the external focus will help our internal focus. By working on these issues, both internally and externally at the same time, I think that actually helps both. Okay, is there gonna... I recognize the delegate Sorry. at the procedural mic. <laughs> it's me again, Karen. Um, is there gonna be an intentional work f within the congregations to deal with cultural biases within the congregations? I mean, is, are we calling for intentional work? I, th I think that's part of the other work that's going on here in this whole GA. So this was specifically to make sure we were doing something externally as well, okay? Okay. I recognize the off-site delegate at the procedural mic. This is from Dave Michael, East Shore Unitarian Universalist Church in Kirkland, Ohio. Move to change the rules, change the 15-minute discussion rule before amendments to 10 minutes. I'm gonna take a little break, talk with my parliamentary team. I, I know what to do, I just need to give a response. The motion is in order. It takes a two-thirds majority vote to amend the rules. So we will be doing that now. All those in favor of amending the rules. Do we have a second? There we go. All right. It's not debatable. This takes a two-thirds majority vote in order to amend the rules so that there is a 10-minute discussion timeline as opposed to 15 minute discussion timeline. All those in favor of amending the rules for a shorter time frame, please raise your voting cards now.
All those opposed? I'm waiting on the off-site delegates. They're still getting some things in. They've asked me for a longer delay period. Okay, please close the queue for the off-site delegates. Okay, the motion to amend the rules passes. Uh, we will now have 10 minutes of discussion before we move to the ability to make amendments. Everyone understand? All right, awesome. I recognize the delegate at the con microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderate. Um, Steve Buckingham from the Frederick, Maryland UU congregation. Um, while I am in support of the social, uh, the activity we've taken on economic inequality at this session, after lots of debate and work, I feel that this is not the time for us to single out economic inequity because it is part of a intersectionality with racism and other issues. We have a new administration taking place, taking office now. They will need to get the, the get guidance and leadership from affected communities before they decide how to approach helping congregations with this work. And I believe that this is an unnecessary additional step to isolate economic inequity and not treat it as part of the greater cultural intersectionality that the whole subject of this uh, General Assembly has been. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. My name is Earl Daniels. I am a member, a delegate from High Street Unitarian Universalist in Macon, Georgia. We do a lot of great work at GA, and then we all go back home, and oftentimes smaller congregations like mine have a difficult time in actually implementing some of these projects and, and resolutions and, these, and to fulfill the intentions. Um, I would like this resolution to pass so that we have an extra impetus to have people designated and people very intentional about going to the congregations and giving them the help they need to do this work. Thank you. All right, uh, before I recognize the uh, delegate at the con microphone, uh, again, a, a simple reminder that we have about 10 minutes to do uh, the remaining two responsive resolutions um, without extending time. So keep that in your mind as you do that. I now recognize the delegate at the con microphone. Marie Cobbs, First Unitarian Society of Chicago. The um, statement of conscience draft, I, it doesn't mention, uh, it does not address the root cause of inequality or its impact on democracy. It does not challenge our current economic system. Only cities' wealth inequality, not income inequality. And I think that that's one of the reasons I have to vote against it. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the off-site delegate at the procedural microphone. Lisa Bickford, Jefferson Unitarian Church in Golden, Colorado. I move to extend time as the last one is the most important in my book. By how much does the delegate wish to extend time? I, I do not have that on the... Okay, uh, if the delegate could come back with that, I'll, I'll give you a second. Um, I have someone else in the uh, off-site line, so I'll come back to that person and then you'll be third in line after that, okay? I recognize the delegate at the procedural microphone. Michael Scott, First Universalist, Rochester, New York. Could someone from the CSW briefly remind us what the normal procedure is for implementing a statement of conscience 
and how that procedure would be changed by this current proposal. Do we have a commissioner in the house? Will you come to the pro mic? I recognize the commissioner at the pro microphone to respond to the delegate's question. Hi, Reverend Caitlin Cotter of the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara and outgoing commissioner of social witness. Um, as I understand it, oh, and here's our chair um, right there at the other microphone. So I, my understanding is that this would not significantly alter our process as everything is a recommendation and this would be only a statement of this body, whereas the statement of conscience is a statement on behalf of Unitarian Universalism that went through a four-year process. Susan, am I right in that? I recognize the commissioner at the procedural mic. Yeah, the, the statement of conscience has been adopted by this body uh, and is, uh, so basically is in effect as the uh, position of the Unitarian Universalist uh, association broadly. Um, the process is a four-year study action process. There is one more year that's called an implementation year. Um, at this time, during this year, the idea is to encourage congregations, because it is congregational study action, to uh, look at what the suggested actions are within it and to um, take action and do it. So, uh, but there are not staff resources any more than um, uh, just st some minimal staff support. So I'm not sure whether this resolution is asking for something more substantial. Thank you. Um, before I recognize the uh, offsite delegate at the procedural mic, um, can the teller tell me if it is the same offsite delegate? Yes. All right. We also need some clarity on whether it's adjournment time or time for discussion. We have not yet reached the 30 minutes allotted for discussion on this issue. So if your motion is to extend the adjournment time, um, our rules say that we are to adjourn by 3.45 p.m. today. So if that is the motion you're making, we have not yet run out of time for this. I recognize the offsite delegate at the procedural mic. Lisa Bickford, Jefferson Unitarian Church in Golden, Colorado. I move to extend time to 30 minutes per responsive resolution. That's not in order at this time because 30 minutes for each responsive resolution has already been allotted. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. My name is Reverend Amy Williams Clark. I serve our congregation at Cedarhurst Unitarian Universalist and I am speaking in favor of this. Uh, because there's intersectionality in between uh, poverty, homelessness, uh, uh, economic, as well as racism, sexism, and uh, militarism, and environmentalism. It's an intersectional piece. It's an important piece to be talking about and to be studying. And in some ways, even more importantly, it's a sign to our partners throughout the country in social justice work that this is something we are serious about and we want to talk about. I recognize the delegate at the con mic. Hi, uh, Sally Gellert, uh, Central Unitarian, Paramus, New Jersey. Um, I rise to speak against this motion because, or this resolution. I believe that there are many organizations who have this totally under control. Uh, 99 Rise, Backbone Campaign, Move to Amend, uh, um, Anti-Poverty Network in New Jersey, I'm sure you guys have local ones, our state advocacy uh, organizations in those states that have them surely have partners. And I don't see the particular value. We also have you used for just economic community. Go there. Thank you. I recognize the off-site delegate at the procedural mic. Kathy Ron Starr from Unitarian Society of Hartford, Connecticut. I'm not sure if it's in order to call the question at this point. If it is, then I call the question. You've got another three minutes, Kathy. All right, I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Uh, my name is Amy Leona from the Unitarian Universalist Church in Livermore, California. I am strongly in support of this statement of conscience. I believe it is a vital step 
towards creating a more economically just community and society. It's only a step, but it's something that we need to start working on as an association, as individual congregations as well. The document does address intersectionality of economic inequality with racism, sexism, and ability as well. So I just urge to support this, and I believe it is just a step that we all need to start working on and continuing and to take each of these. Uh, there's a list of options you can take and ways you can address these issues within your congregations and in society. And I urge everyone to take those to heart, to take those back to their communities as well. I recognize the delegate at the con mic. Reverend Dr. Finley C. Campbell, First Unitarian Church of Chicago, and also a member of UJUJEC. I rise to object and to call people to vote against this uh, proposal because it gives an authority to the board of trustees and the new leadership, which I don't think they deserve. I believe that the confusion and disarray that has been manifested around you the are not of speaking to the merits of the resolution and, and, any and longer. Do you have any other reason that you wish not to have this resolution passed? Okay. Uh, the other reason is that it's a, a neo-racist document because it refers to giving money to black businesses, black communities, rather than strictly to the poor and oppressed communities. They are the one who needs it, not those who are part of the national bourgeoisie of this country. They don't need it. In fact, it's a waste of time to give it to them. We must specify more clearly oppressed black communities. Black businesses like McDonald's and others are dangerous forces of dietary poisoning in our communities. Why should we give them more money? The whole issue of inequality is grounded in a capitalist system, and the word capitalism does not even appear in the main document. In addition, by mixing in white supremacy, a false doctrine, a false doctrine, rather than sticking with the word institutionalized racism, this fatally flaws this idea. We will take parts of it, certainly, back to our congregation, because we fought very hard for a, ver a version that would be more inclusive. Black community, black businesses, et cetera, is already privileging privileging an aspect and by eliminating the word working class, black working class communities, we give carte blanche to very wealthy black capitalists. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Uh, Marcus Foliano, Peoria, Illinois, uh, Universalist Unitarian Church. I was asking a, a point of clarification. Uh, we made a motion to amend, to shorten the time for amendments to 10 minutes. Uh, you had mentioned that we only needed three more minutes to make uh, uh, to call the question. So I'd like to make a motion that we set that as, at 10 minutes as well. Does that make sense? Let me, I'm, I'm gonna consult, I wanna give you a full answer, okay? Okay, thank you. Marcus, is your question whether you can also call the question after 10 minutes? Yes, I'd like, Yes. That's correct. You can call the question after 10 minutes. That's what we did when we shorted, shortened the amount of time required for discussion. We did that for amendments. We did that all together. Oh, okay. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedural make. Hi, Nikki Moore, UU of Marblehead, Mass. Um, sorry, let me say that again. Can you hear? Hi, Nikki Moore of UU Marblehead. Uh, I uh, propose that we limit any off-topic subjects uh, just immediately so that we're not wasting much more time here. The chair uh, acknowledges the ability to be more assertive and keeping us on topic. Thank you, I appreciate that, Greg. I recognize the commissioner at the procedural mic. 
Uh, this is Susan Geckler. I'm actually a delegate from the UUs, uh, UUs of Southern Delaware. <laughs> just want to clarify that we have already adopted the statement of conscience itself, and that's not the resolution that is under consideration. So discussion about the content of the statement isn't really uh, appropriate at this point. Thank you. Do we have anyone else at the procedural mic they're discussing? All right, I recognize the delegation at the pro mic. There's two people delegation. I'm, I'm Carolina Kravart Graham from Church of the Larger Fellowship. I'm also on the steering committee of Allies for Racial Equity and we have been in consultation with our accountability partner, DRUM. Um, we would really, really urge you to support this. Um, it, although the language might not be perfect, the intent is there and I think the language, we, we have full confidence that the language is going to make its way into what it really needs to be. So we really, really urge you to support this. Thank you very much. I recognize the delegate at the amendment mic. Thank you, Moderator Boyd. I am Deborah Gray Boyd, but not related to you. No, and from not. the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Columbus, Ohio. I am here today because I am struggling with the depth and the complexity of things that already exist at the Unitarian Universalist Association. And so I move to strike the phrase to appoint a committee we have enough committees. I'm serving on one of your committees and I'm grateful to do that, but we have enough committees. We have a fabulous Unitarian Universalist staff. We have an amazing Unitarian Universalist board. And so this body can call on those folks directly without creating yet another layer for us to move through. It is my opinion that having so many different groups assigned to different small -er tasks is not in our best interest. And so I therefore ask this body to strike to appoint a committee. Okay, all right, do we have that up on the screen? All right, all right, there we go. All right, we, we have the amendment moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the amendment? If you would like to discuss the amendment, I need to see folks line up at the pro or con microphones. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Very briefly, considering this calls on our existing staff to help us out, I withdraw my move at the con mic, and if this passes, I think it's a good thing. Anyone speaking against? All right, um, it sounds like you're ready to vote on this amendment. All right, uh, this is a simple majority. All those in favor of striking the words committee, can I get that back up on screen, please? All those in favor of striking to appoint a committee from this uh, responsive resolution, uh, please indicate that by raising your delegate cards now. All those opposed? Can we bring up the offsite? Please close the offsite queue. That passes. All right, can I have it back up on screen as amended? There we go. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Robin Stillwater from Fourth Universalist in New York City. I would like a point of clarification. The motion that we voted on a few moments ago to shorten the time when you can start making amendments to 10 minutes, the wording of that was to shorten the time to allow amendments to be made, not motions to table refer or to call the question. If the wording was intended to shorten the time also for allowing motions refer or uh, tabling, referring, and calling the questions, I would have voted differently. However, the wording of the motion did not reflect that. And I would like a, a clarification on what exactly we voted on. The ruling of the tri moderator is that the intent of the amendment time is to make sure that you also have enough time to properly discuss 
the issue. So by consequence of shortening the amount of time needed to make an amendment, we also shortened the amount of time we required for discussion. Well, I would agree, it, just point of clarification, on the motion that we already voted on, that now the wording and understanding of is being changed for, allowing time for amendments before we allow time for calling the question allows wording to be changed in ways um, that disrupt the pattern of uh, um, having things move quickly, expediency, and therefore helps disrupt the patterns of patriarchy and white supremacy. And therefore, I disagree with the motion that I voted on earlier, and I disagree with that ruling. And, I... and actually, as far as Robert's rules of order go, what we voted on is what we voted on. Do I hear a motion to overturn the ruling of the chair? I don't, I don't, um, to overturn, I don't, I, yeah, motion to overturn the ruling of the tri-moderators and to readopt the actual wording of the motion that we voted on. There is a second, this is debatable. Would anyone like to speak in favor or against overturning the ruling of the tri-moderators? Unless you have a, an additional statement to make in favor of that, do, do you need to speak again to? Well, I mean. I, I recognize I, the delegate at the pro mic. Robin, still from Fourth Universalist, I, I don't think this should need a motion. I am asking us to follow Robert's rules of order and to have the wording be what we voted on. I, I, it shouldn't need a motion. It should just be, if we're going to follow Robert's, that should just be how it is. I, I understand. Okay. I, the tri moderators made a ruling about that interpretation, and so now the way to overturn that is by making the appropriate motion, which you have done. All right? Okay. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Still Robin for no, no, you? No, no, not you. <laughs> the one behind you. <laughs> you already spoke in favor of this. My name is Gigi Gordon. I'm from the Marquette Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Marquette, Michigan. I speak in favor of the proposal because um, Income inequality. This is not in order right now. We are speaking in favor or against overturning the ruling of the chair. Mm -hmm. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. David Shea, Valley UU, Chandler, Arizona. The advantage of just reducing the time for amendments then allows folks to make amendments before everyone lines up to call for the question. During the entire time we've been here, that was the first time we've had an amendment. I've seen lots of people not be able to make amendments. So it's essentially a motion for fairness. Thank you. All right. Um, I need a quick clarification. I have an off-site delegate at the con microphone. Is that an off-site delegate um, speaking to the motion to overturn the ruling of the chair? Yes, it is. All right, I recognize the offsite delegate at the con mic. The offsite delegate's name is Abigail Humphreys, First Unitarian Church, Toledo, Ohio. Uh, I am a delegate from First Unitarian Church, Toledo, Ohio. I think we should embrace the intent of the tri moderators and honor their ruling. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Erin White from Fourth Universalist, and I um, am in favor of overruling the finding of the, the interpretation, sorry, of the tri-moderate, uh, because I did think that we were voting specifically with respect to amendments, because there has been difficulty in making amendments um, in this General Assembly, and I know that, for instance, I was standing on the last resolution and unable to make an amendment that the author of that resolution was in support of because of the rule that required me to wait 15 minutes but allowed for the motion to be called before any amendments could be made or proposed. Um, and I found that a very exclusive and I find it not at all ironic that in a motion um, about inclusivity, I was excluded from participating in that conversation. And so I strongly um, urge that we reconsider and, and overrule the finding of the tri with all respect. Thank you. All right. Uh, is the delegate at the con mic speaking to overturning the ruling of the chair? Yes. All right. I recognize the delegate at the con mic. My name is Mary Beth Spencer from Mount Diablo UU Church 
in Walnut Creek, California. And I would like to have us able to discuss um, all of the things that we want to discuss today and get through all of the things we want to discuss today. And I know that our time is at a premium. We have discussed, we did get to vote on the um, shortening the time and I think that we do need to figure out how we're going to limit ourselves. I was under the impression, and I think a lot of us were under the impression that we were voting to make some expediency decisions. And so we're going to have to cut time somewhere. And we did vote to amend Robert's rules, and I think that that is what we did today. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Hi, uh, Mr. Troy Moderator, I think the wrong clock is running down. I think we should be on an amendment clock, not the motion clock. I came over here at 1527. Okay, well, I will, I'll check that out in a second. Did, did you have a... That was, that was my point of uh, information and, and checking on process. Okay, I'll check on the clock. All right, seeing uh, no other folks in line for... I, oh, okay, I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. This is David Michael, who is East Shore Unitarian Universalist Church in uh, Kirkland, Ohio, the maker of the motion that is it dis being discussed. My original, a point of clarification, my original intent for the motion was to give time for amendments before calling the question. All right, could I hear that again? This was the maker of the motion who says, my original intent for the motion was to give time for amendments before calling the question. The tri-moderators hear you. The, we will make it so that it's 10 minutes before amendments, but still 15 minutes before discussion. Bravo. Does the delegate who made the motion to overturn the ruling of the chair withdraw the motion? Thank you, Robin. Bravo! Excellent. Leon, it's time to sing. Yes, you. You, Leon, little old Leon. It's time for, it's time for us to sing. I'm sorry, I was caucusing with some of my fellow musicians. It happens. Could I ask the tech deck to please get ready, gentle, angry? <laughs> Marcus, where are you, Marcus? Oh, my goodness. Okay, well, we'll put it up and I'll, we'll just sing it a cappella. <laughs> gentle, angry. Um, gentle, angry, one, seven, zero. L look on my, look on my thing. Give me an F. One. All right. Everyone, are, are we have words up? All right. Let's go. All right. Ready? And we go. And we are gentle, angry people. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a gentle, angry people. We are singing, singing for our lives. Keep it coming. We are a justice-seeking people, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a justice-seeking We are singing, singing for our lives. We are young and old together, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are young and old together, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a land of 
many colors, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a land of many colors, and we are singing, singing for our lives. This is with the permission of the composer. We are gay, straight, trans together, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are gay, straight, trans together, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a gentle, loving people, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a gentle, loving people, and we are singing, singing for our Thank you so much, Leon. Please take your seats. We want to get to more singing, don't we, everyone? Yeah. So we have to be out of this space by no later than 3.45 p.m. We have a new president that we elected. We want to install that person. We have new people that we elected to other elected offices that we want to install. And to do that, we have to get through our process. So how much more time do you want to spend discussing Resolutions you basically want to pass, all right? How much time do you need to discuss something you want to do? I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. I, I apologize, I just don't think it's a foregone conclusion. I'm Gigi Gordon, I speak um, on behalf of the Marquette uh, Michigan Unitarian Universalist Congregation. I support this resolution because I think anything we can do to elevate the, um, the uh, visibility of the issue of economic inequality that's so integral to all of the other issues we've discussed is vital. Um, somebody earlier said that these issue, this issue is well in hand, but I hear very few candidates for local, state, or federal office talking about the issue, and they should be. So I am in favor of this. And I actually have an off-site delegate at the procedural mic first. I recognize the off-site delegate at the procedural mic. This is Amy Young, West Shore UU Church in Cleveland, Ohio. If we have time to sing, we have time to leave voting open for a full 90 seconds for offside delegates who are experiencing lags that result in not getting the voting option to pop up before voting closes. Please set a clock for 90 seconds when you open the voting for those of us who cannot listen in on the teleconference. Several of us have auditory disabilities and need the captions in the video feed to follow along. Tech Deck, do you hear that? I need 90 seconds. I need a message when we've reached the 90 second mark. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Matthew Mason, board president of UU Fellowship Stanislaus County. I would like to call the question. This motion is in order as we have had the appropriate amount of elapsed time. It is not debatable. It takes two thirds majority. All those in yes. favor of ending debate so that we can vote on this responsive resolution, please indicate by raising your delegate cards now. All those opposed? And I'm waiting for a message from the tech deck for the offsite delegates. You can bring that screen up, though.
I'm, I need to get a message from the tech deck. All right, that clearly passes. Can I get the text of the responsive resolution as amended on the screen? Thank you, this is what we're voting on. This takes a two thirds majority vote in order to pass. I'll read so it. I'm too late. That's okay. Whereas, oh, I'll start with the title, Combating and Escalating Inequality, whereas Tom Andrews of the UUSC said that he cannot think of a time when UU values were more under attack than they are today. Whereas Mr. Andrews exhorted us to take vigorous and sustained action to protect and further those values. Whereas the delegates of this 2017 General Assembly approved a statement of conscience regarding escalating income inequality, whereas the causes of escalating inequality intersect with the, uh, with the effects of white supremacy, therefore be it resolved that the 2017 General Assembly calls on the UUA Board of Trustees and UUA staff to help coordinate, strategize, and advise congregations on how to address effectively these deep-seated cultural issues. In order to pass, this requires a two-thirds majority vote. We will wait until we hear from the off-site delegates. If you are in favor of the responsive resolution as amended, please indicate by raising your delegate cards now. All those opposed? Bring up the offsite delegates. We don't call for abstentions because if you did not vote in favor or against, I assume you abstained. The motion clearly passes. Okay, hey, good afternoon. We are now ready to vote on adding language to uh, the UUA bylaws relating to an eighth principle. The study commission. Going to a stu telling a study commission we want them to consider this language. Um, I need to see the um, text of the, uh, thank you. So in the spirit of making sure you all know what you're voting on, appointment of a study commission to consider adding an eighth principle to article two principles and purposes, Whereas the interim co-president's report and the report of the Board of Trustees both address the issues of white supremacy and intersecting, intersecting forms of oppression. And whereas the delegates of the 2017 General Assembly believe that such issues are sufficiently important to be specifically addressed in the UUA bylaws, principles, and purposes, Therefore, be it resolved that the delegates to the 2017 General Assembly call for the board to appoint a study commission to discuss adding an eighth principle that may be, as stated below, we the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote, journeying towards spiritual wholeness by building a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. The moderator recognizes the speaker at the pro mic. My name is Bruce Pollock Johnson. Paula Cole Jones and I wrote this resolution and the uh, eighth principle. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a delegate from UU Church of the Restoration in Philadelphia. At this historic revolutionary GA, we've been reminded to focus on what really matters and on having an impact. Dr. Sanyika has reminded us that UUism has a beautiful universal theology and vision of beloved community that has a deep appeal to people of color and those from other oppressed groups. Our phenomenal co-presidents have reminded us that our practices have often not lived up to this vision and they have modeled the kind of radical action needed to correct those shortcomings, which our new president has pledged to continue. Race is the issue behind the two major crises of our association. Dr. Sanyika has come back home and offered us a unique opportunity for reconciliation and redemption, an amazing gift. The eighth principle was conceived by Paula Cole Jones because our current UU reality is that someone can believe they are living the seven principles, but not spend any time thinking about or acting to dismantle systemic white supremacy or other oppressions. 
Our current seven principles do not explicitly mention beloved community or love in any form or accountability. They do not remind us that this work is necessary to move ourselves towards spiritual wholeness. Our 1997 resolution was not enough to keep our eyes on this prize. Our UU principles are what we all refer to mentally as the core of who we are. The language of the eighth principle is the language we have been hearing and using throughout this amazing GA. Let's codify it as a constant reminder to ourselves of what we are truly all about. Action toward justice is an essential spiritual component of UUism. Okay. Thank we you. We all need to work very hard Thank and you. do uncomfortable things. Thank you. I'd like to remind delegates that we now have about a half hour for all of our closing ceremonies, including installation of our officers. Uh, I would like to suggest that if there's any like amendment type language or clarification or anything of that sort, uh, you're welcome to email that to board at uua.org. Please keep in mind that these responsive resolutions do not have force and effect of law. They are not binding. And so spending a lot of time crafting language may not be the best use of our time if you want to see the closing ceremonies occur. Now it's up to you. If you want to spend the next half hour debating, we can do that, but then we won't have any closing ceremonies. We won't be able to acknowledge our new officers. The moderator recognizes the delegate at the procedural microphone. Hi, my name is, uh, Sam. My name is Sharon Gray from All Face Unitarian Congregation in Fort Myers, Florida. And I've sat through workshops and I've sat through business section, sessions and I thought I heard that any time some amendment or proposed amendment is going to go to a special commission or committee to study that all of the principles and all of the purposes will also be reviewed. That is correct. And I want to confirm that because there were some principles that did not get voted upon this time, and we were told that if anything was submitted to that commission, they all would be reviewed. You are absolutely correct. Thank you. The moderator recognizes the delegate at the procedural microphone. Thank you. Carl Poninen from the Unitarian Universalist Church of Greater Lansing. Um, I uh, heard, I was excited to hear earlier today, the moderator announced that the uh, Board of Trustees will be appointing a commission to look at all of Article 2. So my question, my point of information, if you could clarify, this resolution, does it create a separate uh, study commission? Does it modify the, perp the, the function of the, the study commission that's already going to be in place? Or does it so do something else entirely? And if so, what? Okay. Um, I'm going to look to the makers of the motion, but I understand your intent is to simply direct the study commission that the board will create to specifically address this issue and make sure there's language in there. Encourage their language to be in there. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Um, the moderator recognizes the delegate at the con mic. Marie Cobb's First Unitarian Society of Chicago. The First Unitarian Society of Chicago is opposed to the addition of the eighth principle as proposed by the Black Lives of Unitarian Universities Organizing Collective without the two or three year period normally required for such a change. And we further recommend to our delegates to the 2017 General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association that they vote against any attempt to bypass this normal procedure. Um, okay, this is not a bypassing of normal procedure. There are a number of avenues for bylaws amendments to be considered. The moderator recognizes the delegate at the pro mic. Uh, my name is Denny Davidoff. I'm a delegate from the Unitarian Church in Westport, Connecticut. Uh, it's 1981 in June, and the General Assembly is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I, uh, the newly elected president of the Unitarian Universalist Women's Federation, am standing at a pro mic to begin the process of creating a commission to study our principles uh, so that the uh, subject of feminism can be entered into our principles. 
And four years later, in 1985, that was in Atlanta, we, uh, we ha have what is pretty much our principles right now, which is not only to uh, say uh, this is deja vu all over again, but is to strongly, for my own uh, biases, agree that we should probably, yes, we should have an eighth principle uh, on, on the subject that we were not even thinking about in 1981, more's the pity. Uh, so uh, so I, I speak uh, in favor of this resolution, which I hope will be passed swiftly. Uh, and I, I speak uh, also uh, to my uh, contention that the uh, inclusion of an eighth principle should be encompassed into a review of all the principles and indeed all the bylaws. Thank that you. would be an amendment, but I hope we don't get that far today. <laughs> <laughs> the moderator recognizes the delegate at the procedural microphone. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I'm Jasmine Walston, First Unitarian Church, Louisville, Kentucky. I would like to move to amend the rules to allow us to call the question immediately. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> all right, that requires a two-thirds vote. Debatable? That's all right. And non-debatable. All those in favor of amending the rules so we can call the question after five minutes. In immediately. immediately. Sorry, thank you for clarifying. Okay, um, off-site delegates, uh, Tech Deck, give me a signal when we're ready for them. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Okay, I'm assuming we're looking at yeses and noes in the House and text uh, out externally separately. Okay, uh, in the House and online, um, any opposed? Okay. Um, all right, we have our uh, external outside, offline delegates uh, voting 86% in favor, 14% opposed. The motion carries, and now we can call the question after five minutes, yeah. right? No. Immediately. Immediately. <laughs> Immediately. I've got the yes. five-minute rule in front of me, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we've just changed the rules. Madam Mo The moderator recognizes the delegate at the procedural microphone. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Still Jasmine Walston, still First Unitarian Church, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I call the question. Is there a second? second? Okay. All those in favor of calling the question and moving to a vote, raise your voting cards. Okay. Are there any opposed? Looking to the tech deck for the off-site results. Yeah, we're waiting. Well, this is the end of the UUA as we know it. Okay, the motion clearly carries. So now we are on the main motion unamended. All those in favor of the proposed responsive resolution, raise your voting cards. Okay, and all those opposed. And we're waiting on offsite delegates. <coughs> okay, the motion clearly carries. So this was really hard work, and we really tested the limits of uh, our systems. And I know that some of you feel who 
perhaps felt differently, feel a little bit left behind, but this is how the democratic process works. And so I want to thank all of you, our tri-moderators and our former moderators, uh, Ginny Von Corder and Denny Davidoff, for all of their advice and counsel. So uh, let's wrap it up. Just a couple more brief reports, and then we will do our closing celebration. Our final right relationship team report is up next, and we thank the team for everything that they have done for us this week. Hannah and Stephen. Beloveds, thank you for being here. I come to you with these words written and hopefully delivered as best as I can. As outgoing chair of the General Assembly Right Relationship Team, it has been a great privilege to work in partnership with the Reverend Lisa Bobby Kemper last year and now with the Reverend Hannah Roberts Philnate. And thank you to the members of this year's team, our Beacons of Orange, who have and continue to work so hard. And before I touch on specifics and then pass on this report, I need to be vulnerable and honest with you. I have spent the last 10 years volunteering in this faith, and this past year has been so very, very difficult and very full, as has been the life of our association and this General Assembly. And friends, I am tired, deeply, especially as a young adult of color in this faith, as the proud son of a Unitarian Universalist minister and as a dedicated lay leader. And so I struggle in writing this report in a way that both honors the right relationship commitment of reporting well to this assembly and holds space for all that that is. And friends, all that that is is most certainly not mine alone. So in order to be in right relationship with this assembly and with you, I must own this. And as we look back upon the past several days and consider the work of right relationship building, of listening to one another, of honoring one another, of assisting each other in finding resources, and yes, of resisting the temptation to lean back on comfortable patterns of behaving and ways of being, of the mistakes that we make, the ways that we re-engage, reflect, apologize, do better all while valuing, valuing impact over grammar and recognizing how we affect others within our religious communities. Here in our young adult and youth reserve space in this hall, here as seen in the language of this morning's sermon with the words tribal encircling around the wagon, here within our exhibit halls and workshop spaces and here in the community of New Orleans, here in our faith, a faith full of goodness, of joy, of reason to celebrate and to be filled. And so I do deeply, deeply hope that we will make the essence of this work, this way of being with one another, a constant attitude and practice in our homes, in our congregations, and in our communities. Let us rejoice at the profound possibility to do better. And friends, let us do better. With gratitude to the team out there still in the hall wrapping up the work of this year's Right Relationship team, I stand here as a, the co-chair that will be continuing next year to offer us a little bit of a look forward. As many of our reports have noted, much of the time when we have hurt one another at this General Assembly, it's been that our various ways of showing up sort of grate against one another uncomfortably. You have been served this General Assembly by two leaders under 30 who came up through local and continental youth and young adult leadership structures. And so with guidance from our forebears, we've served with a deep, abiding, and multifaceted understanding of what it means to gather as you use. And all of the ways that we might be uplifted, hurt, 
and profoundly disappointed by those we love. Here at General Assembly and in Unitarian Universalism, we are lifelong radical peace activists and we are career military chaplains and some of us are both. We are youth and young adults who are here to worship in an embodied and noisy way, and we are folks with hearing issues who, for whom background noise makes it difficult to pay attention, and some of us are both. We are UUA staff and volunteers, and we are people whose identities have been marginalized by the structures of the UUA, and many of us are both. Looking forward from that. Several times throughout this General Assembly, folks who have privileged identities, particularly white folks, have come to myself and other members of the team and asked, how? How do I do better? And there are no single answers. We invite you to use the plethora of educational resources that exist in our faith tradition. Allies for racial equity, various tapestry of faith curricula, outreach materials from the UUA, and resources from grassroots efforts like the white supremacy teach-in. And that is just what I thought of in half a minute. There's a lot out there. Use it. And before I say this next sentence, I will say that Steve and I wrote our statements separately and then read each other's. And here's what I also wrote. Dear ones, if I may be candid with you for a moment, I am tired. <laughs> and I know that no matter how tired this work has made me, with the intersections of my identities, I cannot begin to fathom how exhausted you use of color are in this moment. Showing up again and again and again and again with generosity of spirit demands more of the folks whose identities are furthest from the dominant culture. And so, as our team prepares to enter its curious state of suspended animation for the next 300 or so days, I've been wondering what it will take for us to gather again in a better way. And there's lots of possibilities. I just want to lift up one methodology that I feel like has been critical for my own growth and invite you into it. When we feel one of our privileged identities being pushed against and we're getting uncomfortable, I invite us to say, WTF. <laughs> Wasn't that fascinating? To be curious, to be open, and to remember that discomfort is not inju injury. Have a fascinating year, and I'll see you in Kansas City. We believe it's not what you do, but how you do it. When we say that's how we do KC, people are taking notice. They feel the energy. They're joining the momentum. As for us, we're running with it. We're on a winning streak. One that's not stopping anytime soon. Because our passion, hard work, creativity, and innovation is built to last. And we're building with our hands, doing, making, and creating from the heart all day, every day. It's not just a movement or an idea. It's a foundation, and it's speaking volumes. Now's not the time to slow down or get quiet. Now, we just get louder. That's how we do KC. I give you Gabby Cusco from Kansas City. Uh, hello. This has been the most wonderful experience. New Orleans is the most hospitable place. We have quite a challenge in front of us. So how do I get you to come to KC, to GA, next year in 2018? 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Kansas City is a crossroads in so many ways. We still have the visible ruts of the pioneers who traveled the Santa Fe and Oregon trails. And we also have, unfortunately, the sad history of the Shawnee Mission Indian School. But living in the middle of the map has the unique benefits of also being a cultural hub, a virtual Paris of the Plains. So why come to Kansas City? Why come to GA next year and maybe make it a vacation to remember? Because your bi-state UU hosts will help you explore the riches of a crossroads that is experiencing a renaissance. The arts run the gamut of the Grand Chinese Collection of Art and the Buddhist Temple at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. To the tiny treasures of the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures. The eats are more than barbecue, although we do have at least 100 barbecue restaurants. We're really proud of our meaty tradition, but you'll find much more there. We boast some of the freshest innovative e eateries in the United States. Our breweries, such as Boulevard, are world-renowned. And our coffee roasters and growing distilleries will give you a free tour and plenty of free samples, if you don't believe me. The topic of music is near and dear to my heart. Kansas City's music scene is spectacular. From classical music and ballet at the new Kaufman Center of Performing Arts to the historic 18th and Vine Jazz District, to the blues and at Knucklehead's Honky Tonk in the East Bottoms. Kansas City is a music town. Think Charlie Parker, Pat Metheny, Joyce DiDonato, Janelle Monet, and Tech Nine. All hail from Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri. I want you to take a quick little trolley tour ride with me. We just installed a free two-mile trolley right through the heart of our city. And on that trolley, we're going to visit the city market, the Steamboat Arabia Museum. We're going to enjoy libations together at the Power and Light District. We're going to then head down to Union Station and Science City and our beautiful planetarium. And then we're going to visit and be moved by the National World War I Museum, which is directly below the Liberty Memorial. And we'll hop across the street to Crown Center and then the aquarium and Legoland. So bring those kiddos with you. We also have an amazing theater scene with plays at the Missouri Rep. We have the Unicorn, the family friendly offerings at the Coterie. If you plan your trip a little early, you can even make it to the, Shake the Heart of America Shakespeare Festival at Westmoreland Park directly next to All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church in Kansas City, Missouri, which is proudly celebrating 150 years of liberal religion and activism in Kansas City. So friends, Kansas City will not disappoint you. Come visit our city and please feel free to leave your own ruts in our crossroads. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gabby. Gabby will serve as our local area coordinator next year. I'd like to call on our new friend and wonderful supporter, Natalie Jeffords, for our final process observation. Peace and love, family. Thank you so much. I'm going to do an abridged version of my reflection and then write it up for you because um, we all need to sing and celebrate, enjoy with each other before we leave. But I do want to give deep gratitude for this opportunity that you have all gifted us for the past days to witness in this truly transformative moment for you, you. John had to return to his family, but on behalf of both of us, we feel deeply blessed to have been trusted as witnesses of this journey and to also be lovingly held by you all as we, so we could share honestly our reflections with you. So thank you all for your love and your trust. We want to give deep heartfelt thanks to the GA board, tribe moderators and Jim for their vision and support in bringing us here 
and to the Black Lives of UU you and Leslie Mack for their and her unapologetic leadership and making the necessary connections between UU you and the outside world as we all seek the sustainable solutions to our global struggle against oppression, cis heteronormative ableism and white supremacy. We have witnessed the carrying and creating of traumas old and new the hearing and listening to truths. We have seen the hands and urgency of time, motivating and limiting the practice of principles that we have witnessed. And we have witnessed a questioning and building of trust with each other that has influenced and impacted our interactions with each other at this GA. We want to commend the right relationship team, Denise, Greg, Alandria and Kathy for their loving co-leadership and moderating throughout where they have modelled consistently over the past four days best practice examples of how in moments of uncertainty, mistakes, and feeling uncomfortable, that it's okay. And that in stepping over ego and moving with honesty and authenticity, that we will pass through traumatic moments with laughter, love, and humility. Our belief in you, you achieving your vision is so strong, but there is a lot of difficult work for you to do. We have witnessed unique UU tools already present that should be drawn upon in times of trauma, tension, and your transformation. One of such tools is about to come and bless and guide us all once more. As UU moves forward, and from our witnessing, we believe that you will move forward. You know that you have important work to do in both policy making and in carrying out these policies at a congregational and a personal level. We want to, in closing, recall to you four things that you have named that may support moving through some of these tensions and traumas that will play a role in your transformation. Firstly, the Reverend Betancourt reminded us all that in these moments of challenge, what holds us back is our own sense and societal sense of scarcity. The fear that there's not enough to go around. This is a colonial and capitalist tool to restrict our imagination and our innovation. <laughs> Energy, power, spirit is infinite. And you have an abundant community. Abundance of love, of hope, of wisdom. And that sense of abundance in moments of decision making is fundamental to your transformation. The second is in your creativity what John Paul Lederach calls the moral imagination. The ingenuity and the power of the creative to imagine things that have not yet been and to collectively call them into being. We know there is nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. The third is to continue to have graceful perseverance and a persevering grace with each other. This is long haul work. And these two paired values will support your journey and your healing. Finally, in saying black lives matter, you are saying that when black people of color, indigenous and trans folk get free, then we all get free. So build your trust in black and people of color leadership. Give your trust to Blue and trust in the heart and soul of you, you to reclaim your place as a spiritual and thought leader in this movement. It has been such a deeply inspiring and emotional space and time to be in. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here, to share and to build with you. It's been a true honor. Let's go onwards, Ashe. One more thing before we begin the celebration. You've been hearing the thunder, uh, perhaps, and I think it's thunder, and that's Jim, who said, don't forget to say thank you. So I have a few people that I need to thank. And while I'm doing this, if the co-presidents could join me up here, I hate to mess up your routine, but if you're in the house, um, come on up. But in the meantime, I want us to thank our tellers and ushers it's really uncomfortable wearing those ugly vests. So stand up if you are a teller or an usher. Let's thank them. I also
also want to thank our Right Relationship Team. I want to thank our chaplains. If you're in the house, if you, are, if you would rise in body or spirit, thank you so much for your work. For our youth and young adults who brought us new learnings out of the mouths of our young people, we can go forward. Thank you all so very much. <laughs> to the many groups who are making space for people throughout our association, Black Lives of UU, DRUM, Equal Access, our accessibility team, thank you, thank you, thank you for making the space for people. For our friends in Lareda, faith education is all we do, and these are the people who do it. Thank you. To all of our ministers who light lead us and guide us, we are blessed to be among you. To all of our fabulous musicians, from the woman who can't carry a tune in a bucket with a handle, thank you. <laughs> to our amazing staff who keep the wheels on this bus that we are on day in and day out, Thank you so much. To our amazing tech deck who work in the dark, thank you, thank you, thank you. To our board of trustees, I love you so much. Thank you, thank you. And finally, let me see if I can get through this. A lot has been said by and about our co-presidents um, this week, and rightly so. What we have said about them and what they have brought to us reflects their very deep commitment to our faith. Their pastoral presence, their embracing of all constituents, um, the inquiry that they have undertaken to learn more from all of us, the administration that they have had to wade through, and the challenges that they have faced. It seems like they've been with us for a lot longer than 11 or 12 weeks. We have a small token of our appreciation, and if the tech deck could bring up the uh, picture, this is a, an amazing print done by an artist by the name of Daniel Nevins, it's called A Trembling World Waiting to be Born. And we give it to each of you. It will be sent to your homes because the airplane wouldn't have room. Um, it's called A Trembling World Waiting to be Born and it's sent to each of you as a small token of our appreciation for all that you have done in the past few weeks. Thank you so much. And to all of you who joined us this year to make this such a successful GA, we thank you very much. And with that, I believe I declare us finished. So let us begin our closing celebration. And I forgot to say thank you to the General Assembly Planning Committee. You hardly ever know they're there, but they do so much work. Thank you, and I'm sorry.
now I bet you can hear me. Well, GA, we did some things. We've been sitting for a while, so if you would rise in body or spirit and join us in the one thing that I feel most for this GA is that love will guide us. band breaks yet. <laughs> Stage is not quite yet set. So I'll tell you one thing. I also feel this GA is the fire of commitment. Hit it. Oh, 
Thank you. And as we move now into the attitude of worship, I'd like to bring back the concluding hymn from that beautiful service this morning. Life calls us on, and doesn't it though? Here we go. Here in May our time here prepare us for the work ahead as we return to our congregations and communities. And may the flame of this chalice be a beacon of hope we will carry in our hearts in all of the days ahead. The following individuals have been elected by this General Assembly to serve on the following boards, commissions, and committees. On the Board of Review, Reverend Charlie Ortman and Karen Hall. The Board of Trustees, Kathy Burek, Reverend Manish Mishra Marzetti, Christina Ibarra, Sarah Dan Jones, and Tanner Linden. And the Commission of, on Appraisal, Lucas Hergert, David Friedman, and Holly Ulbrich. And the Commission on Social Witness, Reverend Meredith Garman. And the General Assembly Planning Committee, who I nearly forgot earlier, Oshira Misha, Tuli Patel, Chelsea Surface, and Deborah Gray Boyd. And on the Nominating Committee, Reverend Michael Walker, Reverend Joanne Gian Giannino, and Jessica Falconer. Guided by love for this tradition and hope for its future, this General Assembly has elected members of the Board of Trustees and committee members. These leaders represent both new and continuing leadership for our association of congregations and communities. Will these newly elected leaders, they've already risen, <laughs> will you face your colleagues and friends in this General Assembly to be installed to your positions of leadership? Now everyone, please join me as we covenant together to install these leaders to the offices to which we have elected them. May our Unitarian Universalist faith and heritage inform your work and deeds as you serve with our leadership and congregations and staff. May your approach inspire goodwill among all. I covenant to affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. As you signify Unitarian Universalism in the wider world, may you serve as an instrument of reconciliation, hope, and welcome. I covenant to affirm and promote the goal of the community of peace, justice, and liberty for all. May you deal forthrightly and honestly with us, keeping foremost in your heart the health and well-being of our movement, speaking your truth without fear of repercussion and encouraging others to do the same. I covenant to affirm and promote right of conscience and the use of the democratic process. In the spirit of hospitality and understanding among people, may all who cross your path feel they have been heard and seriously considered. I covenant to affirm and promote the inherent source dignity of all. We covenant to encourage you and support you as you serve our movement. May our trust carry you through both difficulty and triumph. In gratitude, we thank you for the to serve.
We gather this afternoon in a spirit of interdependence and dedication to install the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray as the ninth president of the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. In an election held at this General Assembly, the duly selected delegates of the member congregations of the association have invited you to be our new president. In electing you, we have called you to lead us in a spirit of engagement, collaboration, and prophetic ministry. Mindful of the centuries of tradition that have led us to this moment and to the great promise that lies ahead, we look to you for leadership during the coming six years. Do you accept the invitation of our member congregations to be our president? I do. In formal recognition of the election of the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, and in light of her acceptance of the obligations of the office, I hereby install you as president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Susan, it is my privilege to charge you as you assume the mantle of leadership. I did this for your predecessor eight years ago. The challenges of these days are quite different, however, and so is my charge to you. This is a time of great opportunity for this community, but the dangers for Unitarian Universalism are real as well. You begin your presidency in a time of both heightened fear and heightened hope. Even the job you have been campaigning for is changing. New energy and new models of leadership have emerged among us. New partners are pointing the way. New priorities have clearly been set. You have been chosen to navigate choppy religious waters when many of the charts need to be redrawn. In good Unitarian fashion, there are three things with which I would charge you. <laughs> Give me your hand. First, I charge you not to let this opportunity slip away. There is an openness now in which the need for real and perhaps dramatic change can be named and a new way forward can be at least glimpsed. Let me be clear. I offer no rosy picture of an easy way forward. There is real anxiety for the future of this faith that we both love. This extraordinary and unexpected new chance to move toward the beloved community can be squandered by a failure of will or by an insistence on holding to habits of heart and mind that point to our past rather than to our future. I charge you first and most not to let this time of opportunity slip away. Second, call us to become the religious people that we want to be. Do not tempt us to settle for what we have achieved thus far. Do not tell us that we are a white faith. We have never been, and there is no hopeful vision for our future in which we will be. And do not repeat to us predictions of decline. We have already heard that narrative. We look to you for inspiration and commitment to a perhaps naive belief that love may in the end be stronger than either hate or fear.
call us to a belief in the good news our tradition can offer and that our communities can sustain. Call us to become the religious people that we want to be, Susan. Third, and finally, Susan, I charge you to minister to us. You are the UUA president and chief executive officer, and you will be expected to function as manager of a complex institution with significant resources and abundant accountabilities. Those things are all true. But this is a community of faith, Susan, and we want our elected leaders, all of our leaders, whether ordained or lay, to lead in faith. We want you to be a minister to us, not just a manager, Susan. Yes. Be a pastor to this large and yearning flock. Speak out of your own faithfulness, not only about what you believe, but about what makes you have hope. Invite us not to follow you, but to journey with you toward that vision of the beloved community. And so I charge you, don't let this opportunity slip away. Call us to be the religious people that we want to be. Minister to us and with us. I charge you and we bless you and thank you for your gift of leadership. <laughs> Susan, we would not simply install you in your office, but bless you on this journey. We invite you to be still, to take a breath, to be held in trust by our physical and electronic presence, by the literal touch of our hands and the faithfulness of our hearts and spirits. You are companioned most closely now and will be in days to come by your family. So I ask Brian and Henry, Henry Frederick Gray, and Pat and Gary Gray to join us to gather here and lightly lay their hands upon you. We hold in our hearts others whom you love, not able to be with you tonight, yet present in spirit. We're holding your siblings and cousins aunts and uncles, Brian's family and extended family, all of your mentors and companions on this journey, and still others present in beloved memory. Grandparents Marjorie Boyles, Catherine Gray, Chet Boyles and Lee Gray, and so many loved ones and ancestors who have nurtured you on this path. Breathe deeply, remember who you are, Remember where you come from, where you live, where your heart is most at home. You are companioned in this call by a long line of worthy predecessors. I'd like to invite Bill Sinkford and Leon Spencer to join you now to offer a symbol of religious leadership and to lay a hand upon you. As they do this, I also want to lift the spirit of Peter Morales and the gifts that he has offered us. And Leon, if you would present that stall and place it about Susan's shoulders. You are companioned by strong leaders of our association and called to serve and elected by our people, just as you have been. You will be partnered by comrades who will challenge and support you, who will draw your strength forward and look to you to draw out what is best in them. 
I want to ask Denise Rimes to join you now and members of the UUA Board of Trustees. If you are on the floor, that gathering will begin at the front and sides of the hall. I want to invoke the spirit of Jim Key and his fearless leadership. And as we do this, we know how we do this in community. If you would rest your shoulder on the shoulder on the shoulder of someone whose hand in the center of an interconnected web is touching Susan. I invoke that spirit of Jim Key and his fearless leadership. Susan, you are companioned also by your beloved colleagues in shared ministry. I would like to invite religious professionals here on the stage to join you. Friends, as you gather now, can we begin to make concentric circles around Susan? I'm inviting ministers and religious educators and seminarians and musicians and administrators in the congregations, all those who serve professionally in the faith to rise in body and or in spirit. Our ushers are gonna help us form a sacred bridge here. Most importantly, you are companioned in this work by our people, by countless lay leaders who serve their congregations and our movement. There is no one else, no ecclesiastical body, no bishop who can recognize or authorize this naming. The very hands and hearts that embody our faith beyond this place, in every congregation, large and small, in worship, in peacemaking and justice-seeking, in institutional commitment, in the day-to-day -day celebration of life, the very hands that hold our faith are laid upon you now. I ask all those on stage to come forward. Lay your hands on someone who's laying hands on someone who's laying hands on Susan. And I would like to invite all in the congregation to rise in body or in spirit. We're making a bridge, folks, so those of you who have a little bit more mobility, if you will facilitate this bridge and make sure to reach to those who are part of that web, okay? Leave no hearts or hands behind. It is from this trust, from this vision, that your authority derives. Susan, you are called specifically by these people called out and chosen to lead and to listen, to lean on them, on us, for wisdom, clarity, and courage. Friends, join hands in body or spirit. Lift hearts filled with possibility. We're already making bridges. Well done. You in the wider congregation, reach your spirits to those with us online. Those of you in cyberspace, reach your hearts and spirits to us. May this bridge stretch across our faith community. This wider congregation joins with us up here because there is a love that unites us. There is a love holding me. There gathered here in one strong body, gathered in the mystery of this hour, gathered in the need of prayer, imploring spirit to draw near. Please open your hearts, your minds, and hands with me in a spirit of meditation, a spirit of prayer, spirit of life and love moving in all things, in rich bayous and rolling rivers, through red rock desert 
and deciduous forests running silent under ice. Among the stars and between the stars and atoms and part and parcel of them. Spirit that sounds in the voices of birds, the voice of thunder, the laughing voices of children, and the tireless wisdom of ancestors. Spirit of life and love moving in all things and in each of us, gracious God of a thousand names, be with us in this moment. For the gift of wise and willing leaders, lay and ordained, we are grateful. For this historic beginning of our first elected woman president as woman of the UUA, nope, I'm going to do that again, as president of the UUA. I'm excited, y'all. Are you excited? <laughs> we are humbled. Let me say that again. We are humbled and proud. May Susan lead us with courage and humility, fully certain of the authority that we bestow upon her here, fully certain of the authority of her own heart and of her call to do this work, this ministry, this sacred servant leadership. May she invoke often the spirit of those who have journeyed this way before and those whose leadership was never recognized. All the saints who from their labors rest. And may she heed with open heart and open mind the various variegated rich voices of our living faith. Now harmonious, and now and then discordant the rich music of our people. May she heed especially the voices of the voiceless and of the young who are not only our future, but our present. Above all, may she listen every day to the constant whisper underneath that clatter of responsibility, the voice of the God of her understanding, the voice of all that is holy. May Susan speak plainly tenderly and boldly to the wider world, the saving message of Unitarian Universalism, of our principles and of our purpose. May her conscience resist the compromise of conformity, convention, or an excess of caution. May we who are her partners in this work offer Susan our deep trust and the pledge of our support. She has taken up a joyful, but sometimes lonely office, and we would offer the best ministry we know. May our association thrive through Susan's tenure, our movement grow deeper, stronger, broader in spirit. Our calling one by one as a gathered people is to grow our souls and serve the world. Together with Susan, hand to hand, heart to heart, Spirit by spirit, may each of us answer with gladness and gratitude. Amen and amen and amen.
These last few days, we have created a temporary home for our hard, loving, joyful work for learning to resist hate and harm, for rejoicing together. We have found a deeper understanding of what it means to be home as Unitarian Universalists in this time and in this place. Home is complicated. <laughs> home is a place where we share. The home you claim is never yours alone. Home is every place, and every place is someone's home. And often the stranger isn't who you think they are. Home is where the heart is, and a part of us will always stay in this enchanted city. Home is culture and resilience. It's the food. It's the people. It's the music spilling out onto the streets. Home is opportunity and struggle, and both have been found here. Home is a place we each experience differently. Home is supposed to be safe, welcoming, nurturing, grounding, rejuvenating, but it isn't always. Home is the stories of overcoming so much. Home is the witness and the will of a people always striving and overcoming. Home is the promise to support each other and the commitment to be our best selves. Home is a place to begin again in love. Home is complicated. <laughs> Home is the place our heart wants to return to when there is no place else we can be. Home is a refuge, a place to recharge our spirits, our bodies, and our courage. Home is abundant love and radical hospitality. We found all those things here and so much more. There is no place quite like New Orleans. And there is no home like Unitarian Universalism. Welcome, Welcome home! home. <laughs> Beloved Unitarian Universalists, we have spent time together. We have spent this time together on a journey, finding our way together, sharing our stories in this beautiful city and this sacred space that we have for these last few days called home. And these holy moments. In these holy moments, we have become more courageous, more confident in our call to resist and to rejoice. Give us strength. We have become stronger resisting the urge to go back to the way things were. Give us strength to go down the winding road. The winding road is illuminated by love. Until We know the way. 
however hard the road. We know our faith is big enough and strong enough to be home wherever we are. And I We will meet again, whether we're back home or gathered together next year in Kansas City. We know the way, and if we don't fully know the way, we'll find the way. Our hearts and our souls will lead us to resist and rejoice in the work. And as we ease on down the road on our way to Kansas City, let's go. See you next year. <laughs> we send you out with the joyful song by Charlie Smalls from the musical The Wiz. adjournment of the assembly. Is there a motion from the board? Moved that this general assembly is now adjourned. This is not debatable. <laughs> All of those, including our off-site delegates in favor of adjournment, please so signify by raising your voting cards. Wait for the, wait for the, we're okay? Good, we're good. The motion to adjourn is carried. I declare that the 2017, oh, any opposed, seriously? <laughs> I, de 
I declare that the 2017 General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association now stands finally adjourned. Have a wonderful summer, and I'll see you in Kansas City.